The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. the board meeting to order and we'll start with roll call. Sandy, please. Becker? Here. Maloney? Here. McCoy? Here. Shelton? Here. Warren? Here. Um, there's five more board members present. The other two board members are excused this evening. Um, at this point, there's not a reason that we need to convene in closed session unless there's somebody that feels the need. Otherwise, then I'll entertain the first motion under um, employment of administrative staff. I move that the employment of Gregory London as co-principal 12 months at Franklin Middle School, effective August 19th, 2019, contingent about pre-employment requirements as presented be approved. Is there a second? Second. All right, Sandy? Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 5-0. I move that the employment of staff as presented be approved. Second. Seconded by Andrew Becker. Um, anybody? No comments? Okay, Sandy? Becker? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Carried 5-0. I move that the resignations of staff as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Warren? Aye. Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 5-0. I move that the transfer of Sheba Mays, associate principal 11 months at Franklin Middle School, to co-principal 12 months at Franklin Middle School, effective July 30th, 2019, as presented, be approved. Second. Sorry. Second. Sandy? Shelton? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 5 0. And no, Sheba is here. here. Come up, come Just, up for your close up. We are being filmed now, Sheba. <laughs> yes. And um, Dr. Langenfeld would like to make a comment. Congratulations, Sheba. Yes, yes, thank Have a seat. So I just, I wanted to share this um, dual leadership principal model is the first that the district has engaged in and we're very excited about it and very enthusiastic about uh, both Sheba and Greg coming as co-principals and dual leaders uh, at Franklin Middle School as we move forward into the next school year. I did want to thank Sheba and Greg um, for their, their strength during this process um, and affording us the opportunity to get to know you. Uh, collectively, both in, as individuals and the strengths that you both bring. And we're very, very appreciative of your willingness to move forward with this model. I also want to thank Judy Wigan for her leadership in this. And um, she will be embedding herself once a week at Franklin Middle School to make sure that every, every voice is heard. I think that um, in our opportunity to meet with staff, we really felt um, um, their their passion for the school and for the school community and um, looking forward to how we move forward in this school year and Judy will be there present along with other central office embedded staff to support you in this journey we are looking forward to a wonderful year and congratulations to both you and Greg yeah. <clears throat> thank you Shiva 
I move that the transfers of staff as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 5 0. I'd entertain a motion for adjournment. I move to adjourn. <coughs> move to adjourn. Is there a second? A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We are adjourned. There we go. We did it. The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. Here. Shelton? Here. Vandenhugel? Here. Warren? Here. Okay, we are in session, and I would entertain a motion to adjourn into closed session. So moved. Second. <coughs> Do you have to read this? Or no, yeah, no uh, she's got to read the motion first. Oh, okay. I move that the board convene in closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, paren 1, paren E, deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. More specifically, to wit, negotiation of collective bargaining agreements pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, paren 1, paren C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. To wit, employee compensation pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 9.85, paren 1, paren C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation of any public employee over which the governmental body, am I, no, that is the same thing, has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19. Point eight five print one print F concerning financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons, preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems or the investigation of charges against specific persons, except where par print B applies, which if discussed in public, would likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data or involved in such problems or investigations to wit administrative hiring and administrative and teacher assignments and pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85 print 1 print E deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties the investigating of public funds or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session more specifically to wit Oak Learning Contract. Is there a second? Second. Sandy? Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vandenhubel? Aye. Sitnikau? Aye. Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 7 0. We'll convene, convene across the hall. Motion to reconvene in open session. I move that. So moved. Second. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we're back in open session. I would like to, um, we took roll call before we went into closed session, but I'd also like to introduce the rest of who's at the table. To my left, Dr. Michelle Langenfeld, our superintendent. At the, um, my far left is Sandy Heller, our board secretary. And my far right is our Intercity Student Council, Victoria Lyons from Preble. And is Luke coming? <coughs> is, 
Okay, all right. Um, anyway, Luke Pisani is usually here too. He may be running late. He's president and represents Southwest High School. You may have had to find a boat. Yeah. Um, do we have any speakers tonight, Sandy? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go ahead and read this then. Tonight the board... This is for the special meeting. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Okay, we'll move on to special meeting. Um, except we do have public comment in this special meeting, right? No, I mean it's, it's here, so I, I should read it now. The board will provide our community with two different opportunities during tonight's meeting to speak before our board. The first opportunity is during our open forum, which will happen after this special board meeting when we start our work session. <coughs> gets kind of confusing. Um, and then the second opportunity is during agenda items where indicated by public comment in places on our agenda. All speakers must fill out a form indicating their desire to speak. If you decide to speak uh, at the last minute, you can speak and then fill out the form afterwards. If you wish to speak during tonight's open forum, you may do so with respect to items that are posted on tonight's agenda or any other matter you wish to share with the board. Please know that Wisconsin's open meeting laws prohibit the board from conducting business on matters brought during this open forum. The board will also permit public comment during agenda items as noted on the board's agenda. During this public participation time consistent with state and federal laws, board members may engage in dialogue with the speakers. In order that all voices are heard, the board will suspend engagement until all speakers have had a chance to speak on that agenda item. The process for speaking during, during our agenda items is as follows. The board will first hear the presentation and discuss the agenda item before calling on those who desire to speak. If you want to speak during a specific agenda item, please fill out a form and give it to the board secretary at any point during the meeting. The board secretary will, fill, will provide the names of those wishing to speak to the board member conducting that part of the meeting and you will be called upon to speak at the appropriate time. Please keep your comments to five minutes. Prior to starting your comments, please provide your name and address. Also, um, I'd like to, to let members of the public know they can view our board agenda and handouts, as well as minutes from past meetings, by visiting the district website at www.gbaps.org, clicking on our district on the left and then Board of Education on the, le on the left. And then on that menu, you will find a link to agendas and minutes. This link will take you to a website called Agenda Manager, where all board agendas, minutes, and handouts from board meetings are housed. All right, um, so then I will uh, we'll move to our first discussion item. I move that the resignations of staff as presented be approved. Is there second. a second? Second. Sandy? McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vandenhuble? Aye. Carried 7 0. I move that the employment of Janae Banks Wilson as elementary principal 11 months at Tank Elementary School to be prorated based on a mutually agreeable start date contingent upon pre-employment requirements as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Becker? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Vandenhuvel? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Carried 7-0. And I know um, Ms. Banks-Wilson is in the audience, and welcome to Green Bay. Congratulations. Go ahead. I also want to welcome Janae and her family. We had the pleasure of meeting you earlier today. Would you mind um, just introducing your family as well? We welcome all of you, if you wouldn't mind, or maybe Andrea. Just. <laughs> this is our son, Drew. He is six years old. He'll be seven years old in a few short weeks here. Um, our daughter, Nicole, who is five years old, who will be six years old in a couple of 
Anyway, <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you. I move that the employment of staff as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Warren? Aye. Becker? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Sitnikov? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Carried 7-0. I move that the transfer of Matt Heller, principal 12 months at Nicolay Elementary School, to associate principal 12 months at East High School, effective August 6, 2019, for the 2019-20 school year, and be assigned for the 2020-21 school year as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Shelton? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7-0. And Matt's not in here, is he? I don't see him. Okay, thanks. I move that the transfer of Angela Sanderfoot McNabb, school psychologist, Southwest Quadrant, to supervisor of special education, 12 months, effective August 6, 2019, as presented, be approved. Is there second. a second? Second. Sandy? McCoy? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Becker? Aye. Warren? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Sitnikow? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Carried 7-0. I move that the transfers of staff as presented be approved. Second. Sandy? Sitnikow? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Vanden Heuvel? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7-0. Um, and I forgot to, is Angela Sanderfoot McNabb in the room? She's not. Okay. I didn't want to skip over her if she was here. All right. Go ahead, Katie. I move that the food service meal prices as presented be approved. Second. Then did board members have mm -hmm. questions? We want Lynette. Okay, come on up. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Lynette. Hi, Hi Amanda. I was on vacation to our Chinese campus. Good for you. Um, Amanda Chris Kaniak. Everyone knows um, Amanda is, and if you don't, now you do. So I did ask Amanda to join because she's a very important part of our food service operation, also. So I really wanted her to be part of the meeting. So as we move forward uh, with the five cent increase um, for our district, um, we feel that it is very important for our students. Um, what we want, we want this for our students. And I'm not sure, some of you may know this, or you may all know this, but I want to put this out to everyone, that our food service operation is self-funded by Fund 50, that um, it does not come out of the Fund 10 mm -hmm. budget. And um, thus far, our program has been self-funded. And with those self-funds, we have the opportunity to enhance our programs at our school. And when I, when I talk about enhance, yes. Yeah. Could you turn your mic on? Please? Oh, is it? Yeah. 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 Hit the little yeah. face button. It looks like an ear for the mouth. Oh, there we go. I like the, all right. I like the sound better, by the way, but all right, no, sorry. Okay, so with our department and with the five cent increases, what um, we have been doing and what we want to continue to do is we want to keep up with the food trends that we have been doing. We want to, in our grab and goes, in our middle schools and in our high schools. 
I'm not sure if everyone has been out to our schools, but we're really enhancing the program and we wanna be innovative by doing the bento boxes, um, by having these grab and goes for our students. We have also, we've been marketing our homemade hummus with flatbread, with fresh fruit, and these options for our students to grab and to go, and also the adults. Also, we're looking at expanding our options in our elementary schools. We are concentrating at our Red Smith Elementary School where all of the elementary school um, students from kindergarten up to grade four used to go through the line and they would go through the line and everyone got the hot pack and they would go through the salad bar. Well, we wanna take that one step further where we want to offer the hot pack and a salad bar to K through two. Going to our third grade, they, we are opening up the, the cafeteria to third, fourth, and fifth graders. And this is very exciting because we have low participation at Red Smith. And at one time we had wonderful participation, but the program changed. What we need to do is we need to be innovative and we need to change because students change the way that they're eating. So we have worked very hard over at Red Smith, setting the line up a little differently. Worked with the principal. This started last school year that we were doing this. We sent surveys out to the family to find out uh, what were they thinking? Would they like this? Uh, and they were excited about, about it. We, um, Amanda actually worked with Gwen here in the district on the survey and sent it out to the families and the feedback that we received we did not get a lot of feedback but also was towards the end of the year but the feedback that we did receive we thought it was positive enough to move forward and make the change we've worked on a letter that's going out to the families and we are also working with willie the school principal Burkles, on how the students are coming through the line because that can also um, hinder the program also. If the students are coming in and they're going and sitting down right away, the students want to eat, so they're going to take a cold lunch. So he's working with us to get the students to go through when they come in, go to the hot lunch line. So um, we're very excited about that, and I'll make sure that we do give you an update how that will be working out for us, for our district. Breakfast in the classroom. We do breakfast in the classroom at some of our schools. And today, actually, we did meet mm -hmm. with um, the principal at Beaumont. And um, I will let you talk about that. Sure. Sound good? Yeah. All right. <laughs> no, that's all right. So Beaumont Elementary was expanded to be included within our Community Eligibility Provision, or CEP, schools. Um, so we we're able to provide meals at no cost to the students there. And Lynette and I set up a meeting with Jamie, the principal, and she was very eager and said, we would like to do breakfast in the classroom. So we're really excited to mm -hmm. offer that. Um, she's worked with her administrative intern, and they have a really great game plan on the books um, they're meeting with their leadership team tomorrow up to finalize. And we, I met with our food service worker today, and she is also really excited, not only at breakfast, but they're also thinking about some other items that they'd like to do at lunch. Yes. Are you planning, you're planning on doing a presentation yet tonight, right? In addition, or are these together? Oh, okay. I think there was a misunderstanding. Oh, I That's what. Okay, I apologize for that. And I guess what I'm doing is I was talking about um, this is with our five cent increase. All everything that we are doing, this is with the five cent increase of what we are looking at. So I do not have a PowerPoint presentation on this. It was the reason behind what we would like for the five cent increase, what we want to put into the schools, and um, if you would like. We can wait until that time to do the present, you know, continue conversation. It's, um, do you have a presentation yeah. different later? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yes. So this is. Yes. Everything's verbal though. It's the, no, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. No, that, yeah. But you're on the, you're, I just want to clarify, you're on the agenda twice. Mm -hmm. We did see that. Okay. Yes. Mm 
and so this special board meeting is just specific to five cents and if what you're telling us is related that's fine yes it is but then you have another you're going to present some more things yes, later yes, got it yes. okay i just wanted to make sure am i too loud i don't know what's going I'm on i'm feedbacking here oh. let me see point of clarification okay. on that what's being presented later a food there's a um uh, their food service update is in the organizational support. It's okay. An it's right. an agenda item. And this okay. is this is specific to the five cent increase. So what they said was that okay. they're telling us things related to five cents. I just wanted to make right. sure okay. that we were clear as to what was happening when. Yes. Yeah. You are yeah. Okay. So sorry, carry on. No, that is, thank you. So with the meeting that we had mm -hmm. today five cents that assists us in for all the classrooms that she has at Beaumont we're gonna to have to purchase carts we're gonna to have to purchase bins we're gonna to have to increase our food service possibly her labor so um, I just wanted to pass that information on also um, and then also we put in new cafeteria tables at the schools. Um, the food service department pays for those too. So with us managing our budget to be self-funded and how we are operating, those are um, we're able to take the revenue and put it right back into the school district, into our schools. Are you ready for questions, Lynette? Of course. You ready yes. for questions? Mm -hmm. I didn't want to stop your presentation. No, of right, Rhonda and then Andy. <coughs> um, thanks. Um, I do have several questions. Um, so you just mentioned carts, bins, some additional labor. Um, and I, I do understand that you've been self-funded. But at this point, we're asking the public to pay an increase. I know we keep saying it's five cents, but five cents adds up uh, per meal, per day, per student, per multiple student. Per month, right? I mean, we know it's not really five cents. It's it's bigger. Um, and so my question is, do you have, well, one of my questions is, do you have any sort of number that you're looking at? And because there's an increase, how did it come to be that there needed to be an increase? Was there any financial paperwork available as far as this is where we're at, this is where we need to go, these are the itemized numbers of products that we need to acquire I because I think that's it's extremely important for me as a board member to know because someone's going to ask me there's an increase what am I paying for when I don't have an itemized list of anything that's really important um, is there anything like that you have what we do have is there's a paid lunch equity that we do need to do for with DPI. And I can tell you right now, um, I did receive an email from DPI that says we have to raise our adult prices to $3.70. So that is something that we have to do. Our adult prices need to go up five cents. As far as us going um, up five cents in our schools, that does not, our um, reduced prices do not increase. Those are set by USDA DPI. Breakfast is 30, lunch is 40 cents. As far as free, it will not touch our free students at all. Um, our reimbursements that we do receive regarding our reduced and paid students, they are covering the cost for those students to eat, but they cannot fund the paid students to eat. And that is regulation. And with that being said, um, we can just look at actual increases that our packaging is an added cost. Uh, we um, have increased food cost and then CPI. CPI, if we look at the cost per meal and we multi and I looked at it at a 2.1%, it would have been six cents. I, I, roll, I, I went backwards to five cents. CPI right now is 2.44%. So with that being said, I did not do the 2.44%. With a program, and I'm not sure, um, I don't really want to discuss comparisons with other districts, but what I do not want to happen with us here in Green Bay, we've been doing a five cent increase 
and we have not had anything negative within our community. If we start doing a 10 cent, 15, 25, which other school districts have been doing, that's where I feel that we would get more. And I, when I say feel, I know that's personal when I say that, but that could still hinder our program. Any of our CEP schools, or 21 schools that are CEP, this does not affect any of those families. We still want them to fill out the free and reduced applications though, because of the benefit for the district and for the school. So with that being said, um, we know we have a lot of work to do, but what I, what I do not want for our department or for our district, and when I say all that, it's our kids. We have a wonderful food service program, and I don't want it where it comes we have to cut. And what we um, have been doing is we run a very, a very good operational budget. We have put money back into the district we were told by DPI, you need to spend some money. That's exactly what we did. When you look at Edison, when you look at Baird with our, um, our, re our, gosh, our new construction, what we've done, food service was able to help with that. So then the referendum dollars were put in other areas also. So can I get some information for you of where we want to go and cost and move forward? Absolutely, we can do that. Um, this summer, what we have put into our schools, are, we have six schools that are under construction that does not, um, is not Red Smith, or excuse me, Baird. It's adding walk-in coolers, adding new ovens, adding new cafeteria tables because we are able to do that. Thank you. I think it's really important to, to note, and I want to just go on record saying that it is definitely not going to affect families who receive the free and reduced benefit um, across the board. But it's also important to look at families who aren't in that category. I'm one of those people. Because my daughter's at Franklin, I actually am in a CEP school. And I'm very grateful for that. Because she loves your food, and she's very excited about that, that she, and that she can eat that every day. But I'm going to tell you what would really not work well for me, personally, is if she had to spend money on that every day. Because I'm a person who's in the cracks. I'm not a person that would fall into the reduction. But yet, not really, you know, the increase is, is significant. The price itself for families is significant if you're not in that if you don't fall into that category and you don't happen to be at a CEP school and those are the families that I'm thinking about today and frankly those are the families that I've heard about and, and they've reached out to me so I understand that we want to increase um, productivity we want to increase um, enhance the, the programs but what I'm wondering about is is there any opportunity that's been out there that we didn't take advantage of to possibly offset this. Because from what I understand, unless I'm wrong, um, is that there are 29 schools that are um, eligible. You said there's 21 that are participating. But there still are some schools that are eligible for community eligibility provision, correct? For CEP? Yes. I'm sorry. For CEP? Yes, okay. you're correct. Okay. So my question is, um, no, I know. So this is where I'm. It's where okay. I am at because mm -hmm. I could just roll. Thank you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. See, she's wonderful. I could just roll into my presentation right now because I have information on that also because that is something that we did look at as a district. Um, so it it ties into it does it ties into everything. So I don't know where I should go right now to be honest with you, school board, because we I I could pull that information. I could talk to you about what our reimbursement dollars would look like, or I should say would not look like for the district. I could talk about universal free, because we looked at that as our department. I could tell you what that would not look like. I have that information. So 
You tell me how you would like this. Because I would also like you to include, you said there were breakfasts in the classroom as well. Because we talked about that we have the largest breakfast gap in the state. This district does. And that there's a hunger task force attempting to work with the district and trying to get some, some more breakfast. Because if you look at the numbers of participation with, with breakfast compared to lunch, it's very, very huge gaps in that. Um, I'm wondering how many would be interested in actually um, doing, bringing more, because to me it's lost revenue. If we can't, we could be gaining more revenue by having more breakfast in the classroom. Sorry. And then we maybe wouldn't, maybe wouldn't, but I'm not finished. Maybe we wouldn't actually have to increase um, costs on families that are already struggling probably to pay lunch today. And I understand ex everything that you're saying, and I thank you for that. Um, there's a reason why all of you are on the board, because you care for the children in this district, just like none of us would be here if it wasn't for the kids, and I truly, truly believe that. And um, we do look at our numbers. We look at our participation. Um, we look at, where do I go with this right now? My biggest concern with <clears throat> is that we have somebody waiting who. I understand. So. so because um, this could be an hour-long conversation mm -hmm. if we if we get going into all of the different areas. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to figure out logistically, is the only guest that we have waiting to present Sally? Is that is that right? I'm, I, that's the only person I see that that uh, has come as a guest today. Everyone else presenting is part of our staff. Is that correct? So we could reorder the agenda. No, we can't. We can't because it's a special board meeting. Is it possible to table an item from a special board meeting to? No. OK, so we need to take the vote and then hear the rest of. OK. Go ahead. You. Um. Andrew. Okay. So I think, I think it's probably unavoidable then that there's elements. Uh, I mean, if there's, you know, I think, and first of all, I just want, <clears throat> I just want to make clear ev everything that you said that you're that you're doing. I I love all of it. With vote, whether how I vote on the nickel is not any reflection on you know you looked at your numbers and you thought an, a nickel is what would fit in best with the legal requirements and you know sometimes i ask questions like well maybe we should you know push it a little bit this time so i guess my my question to you i'm not going to ask you whether or not we should push it but i guess what i would ask you is if if others felt as i did and said um you know i love we love everything you just said, but let's not do the nickel this year and keep doing everything that you're doing. And if that means the next construction project, maybe the department doesn't have extra to help out with, that's okay because we can do that another way, right? Because this year, DPI told you you have to spend down some some yeah. funds. And that's happened a couple other times. Um, so if, if we said, we love everything you're doing, but we'd rather skip the nickel this year. What does that actually do or harm, if, if anything? Well, what I would go back and I'd look at the difference in the revenue. I can't, well, and I have that information with the, with the revenue. Um, the revenue totally, I can go into yeah. this, okay. Right. So with the five cents, if we were to stay exactly where we are at, the difference for breakfast is $2,164. So I want to just give, and that is if our partici participation stayed flat, exactly, exactly the same. Now for lunch, uh, the difference is $17,000. 587.60. Now, are we looking at large amount of dollars? No, we're not. And that is if we do not raise our participation. 
So if we're able to raise participation and at least theoretically increase increasing fees hopefully wouldn't decrease participation much, but over many, many, many thousands of meals, it probably would decrease it a few here and there. Um, I guess I don't, um, I'm not, I'm not that inclined to raise it a nickel just to, you know, just, just because someone, some outsiders told us what we have to do unless, unless we're actually breaking a law by not raising the nickel, but I would want to make it clear. Uh, Lynette, don't. <clears throat> yeah, it. Uh, every yeah. time you turn yours on, you cut him off. Yeah, that's so okay. We, we, didn't, we didn't tell you. We it's didn't tell tricky. You. I didn't uh, tell you, you that up front. So, you didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> if I, I just want to make sure that if you know, unless an actual, you know, unless an actual law is being broken, or if not doing the nickel would force you to change something, and it was an unintended consequence. But if we're talking a very small increase, I'm inclined to maybe not not do the nickel. But again, to say you know, if that's not on you, it was it's what looked right with the books. But maybe the board wants to just have less money left over to help out with the next project sometime and do everything that you're doing. Is it? I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding. Is it? Related to the cost of providing meals to all of our students, that we can't provide a, bit, a more quality to our free and reduced lunch, that the the paid kids have to pay the amount that we would, that we need to spend to provide that quality food. Is that is that correct? That is correct. So if we don't pass the five cents, does that mean? Does that mean what Andrew said, if maybe we don't buy as many chairs and tables, or does it literally mean that then that the that we have to notch down a little bit the quality of the food that we're providing to our students? Go ahead and answer. Okay. As far as the five cents, if this was not passed, we would not change the way that we are serving. Where our fund balance is right now we can move forward with what we're doing. Next year, I cannot answer what next year would hold. I cannot say where I would, uh, where our cost, or what we would be asking for next year. It, could, it possibly could be higher. Than five cents. Correct. Okay, all right. Um, go, to, yeah, go ahead. So when you started, you talked about the adult meal price. What is the term you use that we have to do a match? You said the adult meal price has to go up because it's part of? It, I will, I'm going to word it, read it to you word for word. This came from DPI. That the increase, we have to increase the adult price to $3.70. This is to comply with the adult meal price adjustment. It should be the highest student price plus 67 cents this school year to include all reimbursements. Setting it at 370 would put you in compliance at the CP and non-CEP sites too. Can I follow up? So I, this is, and we had talked many times about this. My, my question is, Sometimes you see school districts with large jumps, 25, 30 cents. Is that, a, is that a function of that? Can we expect that? I mean, that's my concern. If we don't do it this year, are we going to see 10 cents, 15 cents? I don't know. Is that because they could do that? Yes. There's a tool that we have to use, and it will tell us what our prices need to go up. Isn't that what we did this year? This year, we did not. We do not have to increase our prices. Oh, okay. But, but, with a five cent increase, that is the lowest increase that you can do as a school district, and as a director of the food service operation, I want to make sure that overlooking the budget, managing the budget, that we are doing what our due diligence with the program, because of the added costs. Yeah, okay, Eric. Mm -hmm. Lena, can you, uh, what, what is the cost for lunch for one day? It's 
Yeah. Actually, if the, the actual cost, and it came out of the USDA, um, $2.91 on an average. And, and is that what we charge for someone who's going to pay, like elementary like, lunch? What, what would we charge for a child for, to eat lunch? For our elementary lunches right now. Sorry, thank you. For our elementary lunches right now, let me just get... That's it already. $2.65. I do I do have my information with me. Sorry. No. That, that's, that's no. Right. It's less than three dollars. Yes, it is. But you we also get our reimbursement. We do get reimbursement. Yeah, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I'm no, sorry. I thought okay. you no, no. I, just, I wanted to make sure I wanted to make sure that I brought all the information that I felt I needed to answer your questions. Sure. Thank you. Um so if we you know, as a father of a picky eater, unfortunately, I don't know if we'll be eating the delicious lunches that I know you provide. We're going to try and push it, but right now it's not looking good. Um, but if I if I just did some some quick math, um, you know, it, a family if they, if they had four kids in our district, let's say they ate breakfast and lunch, that's eight meals a day. Um, Forty cents a day is what the increase would be. Um, so 180 days, you're looking at $72 over, over the course of the year. Um, and, and Rhonda, I appreciate your um, advocacy because I know that we've got to think about all of our population. But um, the alternative that I look at when I pack my son's lunch every morning is there's no way that I can pack his lunch for $3 a day. Um, so the other thing, and I, I think we just mentioned it earlier, what I would hate to have happen is for us to be in a position where you're sitting in front of us next year and you say, you know, we're low on money, we have to raise it 15 cents, and then we have the, the nightmare where we're going to families and saying, hey, now it's going to cost another $150 a year for you. Um, so that that's one of my concerns about, you know, being able to make a small adjustment. It's about $2 a week, again, for a family with four children. $2 for the course of the week is real money, and we have to consider that. But... Um, it, it's more manageable than if we were to say $5 a week, it's going to increase. So um, I just wanted to make sure all that math added up. Rhonda? Um, yes, but, right? So you stated that we do not need to increase. Right now, we don't have to. So this is, this, we don't have we don't actually have to do it. So what's interesting though, and I think I'm hoping we can think about this in, in, in an opportunity mindset, is what can we do so that we, what could we be doing so that we don't have to increase? That's where I'm coming from. And that's, that's where I'm hoping to maybe take this conversation. Because is it true that if we increase breakfast participation, because of the gap, it's a huge gap. If we could increase breakfast participation in the classroom, that, I mean, there's a reason that that's actually happening. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I'm really excited that that's happening. But I think if we could actually increase breakfast participation, because I'm not sure if all the board members have seen the numbers, but it's, there's a, quite a discrepancy with who has breakfast, who has lunch. Um, we could potentially bring some revenue into the picture where we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't, not only would we have to in, make an increase in prices, we could, we could actually have some revenue to work with. Is that true? I will agree with you that breakfast right now is, um, those are opportunities that we have. And this is something I was gonna touch base on also with my presentation. Um, it is, one in three students eat breakfast who eat lunch. That is proven. Um, as far as our students who are eating breakfast, there's a lot of opportunities and challenges that we have. Even in our schools, as food service, what we do every day, and also um, parents trying to get their students off to school. They will feed them, and then they may go to daycare or they may be going someplace else to watch them before they come to school. And then they're hungry at like nine o'clock. Or, or they're not hungry at nine o'clock when they're arriving for school, but then they're hungry at 10.30. But then we have lunch. So I understand, with, I understand what you are trying to say. And 
what all school districts food service operations are doing right now is that is where we can grow with our participation is with breakfast. We need to be innovative about it, but just because we're, we say this is what we're going to do, is that going to happen in September 1 and we're going to get those additional 870 breakfasts? If you take, I don't have, if someone could do the math, if you take 870 students and you divide that by our number of 42 schools, how many is that per school? That would be great. It's not that big. That number's not that big. But can we make it happen? There are some challenges that are out there for us. But what we want to do is we want to go to the kids. Wouldn't it be great if next year we didn't have to do an increase because of this, that we purchase everything that we need to do? So now I'm just going to turn it, go backwards. Like we buy these kiosks. We go to Franklin on something that we want to do at Franklin. We want to go to where the kids are coming into school, not where the cafeteria is. That's not where all the kids are coming in. We want to go to the door. Um, Preble High School by the athletic department or everyone or at the secondary schools where they're playing ball They're playing basketball That we have these kiosks. Let's go to those kids because there's also a stigma going to the cafeteria We have to change that So Andrew I guess the the, the way I look at it perhaps perhaps it's more regulation driven that we have to raise the adult is that yes. okay so um i guess the way i look at it is if we you know am for me in my individual opinion am i willing to accept the fact that maybe if maybe we would have to do a dime next year if we didn't do the nickel and then there was a, a worse hit than expected with inflation or something that we might be looking at a dime next year, I would, I guess, I would accept that trade-off to not not have to do it this year. And it's, again, it's not a reflection on, I totally get where the, the nickel came from. I think it's a valid perspective to try to just always do a nickel to not have to do a dime or, or 15, but there's a possibility, and I, I also respect the fact that you were looking at maybe we could avoid, maybe we could not have an increase next year. But maybe if things go really well with participation increase with some of these things, maybe we wouldn't have to do an increase this year or, or next year. I mean, yes, someday we'll have to do one again, uh, more than once. But I guess that's where, um, you know, that's where I'm at. And I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, it's a, it's, a close, it's a close judgment call on something that's not uh, – you know, not a huge amount of money if you were, you know, and if, and I respect the fact that you were, you know, if you were telling me things that we, here's, here's something we can't do for next year if we don't do the nickel, I'd have to, I'd have to weigh that. But it sounds like it's just reducing the chances of having to do more in a future year, which we might not even have to do. So um, I'm going to, uh, I believe this would be, in amendment because we're voting on the pricing table so I move to amend the motion by um, keeping it at the 2018-19 meal prices except that adult would go to the proposed so what is your amendment read so my my amendment. Um, You're adding to what's it there? So the the motion. Well, the motion is to approve the meal prices as presented, right? right? So you putting in a clause in this sentence, or are you making a brand new? So, if we do, we have we have to approve meal prices every year, right? So to we can't. So it's not like we, the motion isn't to raise everything. A nickel. The motion is to accept the meal prices. So like you can't just vote no because that would be problematic. So since we have to vote for a meal price schedule, so my I propose to amend the meal prices by having 
by using the current values, except that the adult values would go all to 370. So with the amendment... We're not doing the nickel except for the adults. Right. It's just that the motion wasn't to increase by a nickel, so we can't just... Right, but I, I have to have some. Yeah. So that the foods that the current food service meal prices, with the exception of the adult meal prices, um, as presented, be or something. I don't know if as presented is the right thing. Is that what you're getting at? What? That's yes, what I'm. That, as amended. <coughs> yeah. Right. So the amend the amendment would be to stick with the original table except only the adults would go up by the nickel. The effect of the amendment is that it wouldn't go up a nickel except for the adults. Right, but we have to have words to this. So that the so is your amendment that the 2000 that the food service meal prices for 2018-20 remain the same I don't know how to Yeah, remain the same. Remain the same with the exception with the exception of, of the adult meal prices which would all go to we go to three seventy. Which was, but that's what's already presented though. The adult meal prices has been presented. Can you can you read back to the motion? That's the original motion. The current one that the food service meal prices as presented be approved. Okay, right. So there isn't. I can't amend a mo the motion that doesn't. So the. Yeah, I'm changing the as presented. The amendment is to change the as. Right. So what do you? It needs no, to be. Voted no, then it yeah, but then we haven't approved the meal prices. We have to actually approve them, right? But there might be people. It might actually. Vote for. If you just take a vote on this, if it doesn't, right? If it. If we if it goes through, then it, then it goes up. If it. You could just vote no and say no. You don't want it to go through, and it would stay the same. Well, not not, not exactly because legally we we're not voting. A, you have to vote on meal prices every year. Yes. But you have to yes. vote on some meal prices every year. It's not like something where if you take no act, you can't like it would be illegal to take no, no action because then we would have no meal prices for next year. So if this Shall increase the prices. So we should just take a vote on this first. Vote this one first, and then well, present an amendment. I'm not saying what you should do, but or amend it and vote. Yeah. All right. So, Sandy, do you have something written down? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That the food service meal prices for 1920 remain the same, with the exception of the adult meal prices, which shall increase by five cents. Be approved. Okay. All right. So that's our. That's. That's the amendment. The amendment. That's yeah. the amendment. And will also become the motion if we get that far. If it passes. Yes, okay. right. Can I go ahead. Um we're about to we're about to vote on an amendment. So if you have something to say about that, now's your chance. Yeah. <laughs> it does. But thank you for your insight. Okay. Um I think, uh, I just want you to know where I stand on this. I, it's, it's a both and for me. I think investment in our, in our food service department across the board is, is critical. You all have demonstrated to me time and time again, and I would challenge every board member up here, if you did not go to a cafeteria in one of our schools and have lunch uh, last year, you should do that. Um, I rotate uh, with Amanda and I meet and we go to the different schools and we have lunch and we talk about the food service program and, and meet food staff. Um, and it's Your incredible. Well, it's fine. And you know, it's still, for me, uh, the, and I was going to say this, the fact that we can go and have this fabulous lunch as staff um, and, and pay 370 or what was it last year, 365, uh, is incredible. Um, I do recognize that the increase will, will be significant for some families. It'll be $18 extra per kid if, uh, every year if they eat breakfast and lunch. So that is not insignificant. Um, what I feedback I have gotten from community members 
from what I have heard, uh, is that people were supportive of it if they felt as though it was going to support the expansion and the sustainability of food service. So if this vote goes through, I would ask you to um, keep us um, up to date on how that money is being spent and communicating that effectively to our community so that they know that their money is being invested in the long term. Um, all of that being said, I think there's still a lot of um, ability to an opportunity to increase participation and generate that additional additional revenue i challenge the board and our school district to think uh differently um, about how we serve our meals. Um, the barriers that you outlined and we all have talked about are not uncommon to districts around the country. We're actually not that special in terms of the barriers we face. It's pretty much the same. And yet we know that districts around the country have overcome them and I believe that we can do the same. Uh, eating is critical for learning and eating nutritious foods is even more critical for learning. So um, I, uh, as much as I, um, hate to add additional costs onto families. I do believe that it's investment in, in your work, and I would like to see that opportunity for the participation to go up to. All right, so we have an amendment on the table. Oh, did you? Go ahead. Um, I promised that uh, this gentleman that his voice would be heard. So again, it is significant to some families. There is a single father who has three kids who they take turns. You're gonna have lunch and breakfast this week. You're not. You're just going to have breakfast. You're gonna have breakfast and lunch. This is how this works for some people out there that are not in this room tonight. And I know there are opportunities that we could be looking at. And I do believe increasing the breakfast program would be one of those, um, East High School, 1,279 kids eat lunch, 816 kids eat breakfast, okay? So, you know, Lombardi, 838 kids eat lunch, 397 eat breakfast. So bringing breakfast into the classroom, I think is amazing. I think it's, it's something that could foster community building, relationship building. Um, I'm hoping that some of our buildings will be more open to that. I'm excited that, that there are some that are. I'm still not sure why we don't have, um, with around 29 eligible schools for community eligibility provisions, I'm not sure why we don't have 29 schools actually in that world. I still want to know about that. Um, but it is important, and I'm going to speak for the people that, that do make those really difficult decisions every single day with their families, that they actually have to make those decisions. They're really out there. They might not be in this room, but they're out there. So I just wanted to make sure that, that they were considered. Thank you. All right, so there's an amendment on the table. Do second? Oh, there wasn't a second. Is there a second? Second. All right. Um, we're voting on an amendment, the one that Sandy just read, that says we are keeping the prices the same. Except for the adult. Except for the adult meals. And if it doesn't pass, and if it doesn't pass we will go back to the original, original motion and we'll vote on that. Okay. And if it passes, then we will go back and vote on the amended motion that we passed as the amendment. So the amended, the amended motion will be what Sandy just read, and we will vote on that. Yeah, we want, yeah, we're seeing if this is what we want as our motion. I think she should read it again, just also for clarity and transparency for anyone So watching. do you want this, what she's going to read, to replace what we, will, in our memo. what was in our memo? Yeah. Or if you don't want it, if you want to go back to the original motion that's in our memo, then vote no <clears throat> for the amendment. All right, go ahead, Sandy. That the food service meal prices for 2019-20 remain the same with the exception of the adult meal prices which shall increase by five cents be approved all right go ahead what no we that she's just rereading it we already second it okay this gets complicated becker aye mccoy no shelton no Vanden Heuvel? No. Warren? No. Maloney? No. Sitnikov? Aye. 
So it was, the amendment was defeated five to two, um, and now we will entertain the motion that's already been seconded that's on the table. Um, the recommended motion is that the food service meal, sorry, that the food service meal prices as presented be approved. And that's already been seconded. So go ahead, Sandy. Warren? Aye. Becker? Aye. McCloy? Aye. Sitnikow? No. Maloney? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Vandenhubel? Aye. Carried 6 1. Carried 6 1. Um, I would entertain a motion for adjournment of the special board meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We'll go into, um, into our teaching and learning work session, and that will be facilitated by Katie Maloney. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Are we doing any open <coughs> forum? Thank right. you. Yes. Yep. It's not on my list, but oh yeah, there it is. Okay. Getting used to this new agenda format. I don't know why it's. Can I? I'm trying to. But that's my feedback. Is this going down? I've got a one lid on mine. What do you need to know? Okay, testing. Testing. Oh yeah, maybe it's. Testing. Is that that's better? Yeah, I have none right now. Okay, all right. Um, we do have an open forum, and it's, did you hand me those sheets, Sandy? It looks like both speakers want to speak during the agenda item. Okay, all right. Is there anyone else who would like to speak um, before the board during this open forum time? Or if those who've indicated agenda and want to speak now, you can also ch uh, change when you speak. It's up to you. If you speak, if you speak now, then we won't be able to ask you questions until we get to the agenda item anyway. So if you want to have some conversation, then. Um, and what what are you what are they speaking to, Sandy? One is speaking to the dress code, and one is speaking to the, I believe the. Um, Meeting postings. Okay. All right. So is there anyone who would like to speak at this point, open forum? Seeing none, then we'll move on to um, the uh, teaching and learning discussion item, and I'll turn that over to Katie. <coughs> and I'm wondering if we want to reorder the agenda to allow Head Start to present, and then and is then that let, a, are you making an emotion? And then food service can follow up with that so that we can conclude those two. Except food service is an organizational support. I know, I'm really reordering. You are really reordering. Just I'm just proposing. I'm just saying that because we're getting. Right, but then you're also well, okay. pushing recess and dress code, which is later, which someone's here to speak to. Okay, so. then is it okay with the achievement reduction people if we do the things if we reorder it to do Head Start and then do the, all the, the recess and, and do the... All the discussion items? Right. Ahead of the teaching and learning. Right. Is there anyone from the outside here for teaching and learning? From the AGR report? AGR Andrea. report. Is that okay? Okay. Andrea, is that okay? Thank you. All right. So thank you. what's your motion, Katie? Okay. I move to reorder the agenda to... Um, actually put item five in front of item four. Is there a second? Second. Sandy? Sheldon? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vandenhubel? Aye. Sitnikau? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7 0. So, if we could begin with Head Start Program State Supplement Grant, Sally? Great. I did once this year. <laughs> 
little face. Maybe need eyeglasses for the face. Right here. And we were asking. We we're asking where we can get such t-shirts and we'll yes. be informed shortly. <laughs> so uh, basically we have our annual report on the guidelines and handbook for our Head Start programming. And as we know, we will have uh, an expansion of that programming, but this is something we do on an annual basis to come forward to uh, recommend and, and uh, have approval for the, the uh, changes within the handbook. And as you mentioned, um, the state grant. This is our annual refunding application um, for $113,883. The federal government funds 321 of our 336 children. The state funds 15. The, the budget amount has been the same for as long as I can remember. So um, we are pleased, you know, to be able to fund that additional 15 kids. And then the program guidelines and operational procedures, um, also regulation. To have a handbook of, of policies and procedures, we call it um, guidelines and operational procedures. We do follow district policies and procedures, but there are certain items in the Head Start regulations that don't pertain to any program other than Head Start, such as the way that we enroll children into the program, all of the required health findings, nutrition, um, there's just, you know, the job descriptions, there's unique positions within our department. So um, instead of bringing that 120-page manual forward to the board each year, we were asked many years ago to just bring the changes, the, the, the significant changes to the manual. And so those are included in the report. And if there are any questions about any of those updates or changes, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Actually, just a request. When I was, I know some of these are new and some are revised. Yes. And I'm wondering if, because as I'm reading the revised ones, I don't know what's been in place last year and what's new. Okay. And I notice in one of these, something is, is gray under supporting attendance of homeless children. And I was wondering if that was the new stuff or if it just happened to turn out the font is gray. Um, or so anyway, my request is is just that oh, I think if the font. is it just a font? Okay. Yes, it is. That if if uh, and I don't know if this if this is a lot of work then then don't. But but to be able to see what's new in the revised ones, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have strikeout copies with with what's added and things like that, or how you revise your your handbook. We we the coordinators the the staff that uh, manage services, the health and nutrition, the education, disabilities, family services, um, they all review their section. Um, the new regulations came out in 2017, so there hasn't been a new regulation since then, but sometimes it's the way we interpret them. Or we gain more information from our regional um, office out of Chicago to say, you know, when you say we can reserve a certain amount of spots for homelessness, because they require that we be full at all times, that we maintain a wait list and that we be full, but yet we can reserve a certain amount of spots if a child um, comes in that's homeless so that we're not going over-enrolled. So we, we just wanted, we didn't have that included in last year's update since the new regulations. So we decided as a staff to put that into the operational procedures and guidelines so that all staff are aware that we're going to reserve spots for homeless children. And, okay. I, and I understand what you're talking about, for instance, with revised attendance. Yeah, so so I assume that some of that what's written in that attendance guidelines was what was in last year's. Absolutely. And then there's it, something, there's new mm -hmm. that's been added. Correct. And I don't know if it's, if it's too much work to do the strike. Like, I don't sure. you've seen our policies. I have. We have strike out and words added and things like that. It wouldn't be too much at all because okay. we save the changes for this report each year. Um, I could provide another one that shows last year's probably new under attendance and then this year's revised. And again, the regulation doesn't change. It's the way we interpret it. Or right. perhaps we set a procedure due to a regulation and we find it's just not working. So we want to tweak a few things here and there as far as for in this instance, as far as what we're doing for attendance. And if I'm the only one who wants this, I 
gladly back out um, of my request, but I, I always like to see if we're looking at updates. Yes. I'm curious I, what the what the new th thing is and how mm -hmm. we're reinterpreting compared mm -hmm. to last year and things like that. It makes a lot of sense, okay. Brenda. It really and if does. It's not so too I'm much work, no, just more provide, than happy. Yeah, that'd be great to do that. And All when right. would you like that by? Pardon? I don't I don't need it this year. Okay. Um, just in the future, moving, moving forward. forward. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yes, she's got okay. it. She's bringing Tammy <laughs> along to these meetings now. <laughs> Were there any other questions in any other areas? Also, one thing that uh, I know that Ms. Byer is going to address as well with some of our work is that we're re looking to reinstitute our work groups so that those would be posted meetings, and that would be something that would be going back to our past practice where we would be have, working with a small group of board members to review items that could... Uh, potentially lead to situations where we would have, um, you know, if that was a desire of the board that we we have that change, we could come to the board more fully prepared. So I think that that will be a step that will save time for the board and and uh, lead to more productivity. And we're appreciative that we're moving back to that that work. Well, I also I also want to say thank you to Sally for all the hard work that yes. she's done, as well as Absolutely. as well as Tammy Van. And Laura, are you our Head Start person? Yes. yes. Okay. Is. So that would be another. Place to yeah, to uh, um, have that conversation. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for the suggestion. Thank you, Sally. Thanks Thank for your job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Not a problem. Stay dry. You you earned it, Sally. All the hours you've spent waiting for us. Yeah, okay. we owe you a few. <laughs> okay. Now admission and enrollment. Oops, sorry, admission and enrollment of students in charter schools policy. So, so the thunder is coming as the lawyer approaches the table. <laughs> she brings, she brings it's the not her. <laughs> good. Good evening. So we're bringing forward to you a um, new policy that addresses the admission and enrollment of students into our charter schools. As we have expanded now to two charter schools, we want to make sure that we are transparent to our families as to how to, and not only our own families, but families outside of the district, as to what are the um, procedures and then the statutory requirements for enrollment and admissions into our charter schools. So that's what you have um, in front of you tonight. I want to thank Jen Agamite, Jason Johnson, Renee uh, Every, and Vicki Beyer, who worked very hard on getting this policy drafted. In addition, um, we did have the DPI review it as well, given the nuances with enrollment and admissions uh, for charter schools. And they have indicated that it's consistent with the law as well as their best practices. Any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? Brenda. I ask this all the time because it doesn't doesn't uh, make sense that it's that way. But we cannot give preference to our district students in a in a charter school, and so the open <coughs> enrollment students are shuffled into a wait list uh, with the same um, uh, priority as our own district students. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So this, the preferences are set out in the statute, and there is not a preference for internal students above. Um, students from a non-resident school district. Okay, so then if you have, um, so say the, well, this won't be true for a couple years because we we're going to have new grades entering the School of Innovation. Um, but the other grades, if those, if those grades are full, um, then we're setting seats like we do for the other schools and we we set zero seats for those for those grades and then the zero seats apply to our own internal correct. students as well correct right. okay correct all right that's i think that's all i had and if the capacity is lower than what we would like um we cannot select students and place them students have to self-select into the charter schools Correct, we cannot require students to attend a charter school. Correct. We can't require them, but we wouldn't actually reach out and bring them in. 
they have to self-select in. Well, just like, I don't know if I'm answering this correctly, but just like all of our programs, our counselors frequently meet with students and advise them of options. So they will certainly talk to them about um, project-based learning and about the opportunities that NEW affords, just like they would with um, Bridges Construction or, or any of our other programs. So I, I don't know what, no one is being forced to attend, but there certainly is conversations about the opportunities the schools provide. Christina. I just have a question around uh, preferences and just wondering if this is standard, Melissa, where it says children of charter school founders, board members, and employees constitute no more than 10% of the school's total enrollment. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's the statutory language. Okay, that's what that Correct. I want to call on myself um, under preferences. The first one, if the charter school replaces a public school in whole or in part, preference shall be given an admission to any student who resides within the attendance area. So if we had one that encompassed our entire district as the attendance area, can we give preference to our students? Yes, but it's the attendance area that exists. So I, in my previous employment, we had a elementary school that converted to a charter school, and there was an established attendance area for that school. That's what that language refers to. I know what it refers to, but I was kind of wondering if She's we could. Trying to <laughs> You're fighting the law. <laughs> nice try, Katie. <laughs> Any other questions or attempts? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. The recess guiding change. Recess guiding change document. Um, I, I would like to first of all thank all the folks who came together and, and developed the recess guiding change document. A guiding change document for our for our folks um, who are not familiar with it is an intentional document put together to define the why we need a change. It defines a very critical question that needs to be answered. And um, in this case, it was a question that actually came from the board table with a really important um, concern about the amount of physical activity our children are engaging in in our schools. So the first area in the guiding change really focuses in on the why and really looks at what are the policies currently in place, what are the cultural things that are going on? What are the resources and uh, the research and so on? The second part of the guiding change is really the not how. And in this particular document that you have before you that's been shared and has actually been posted, I want to clarify one item that got in the wrong bucket here. Schools that use recess or additional recess time as a reward is actually a desired result. It is encouraged and supported by the research as a positive to engage students in, research, in recess. So that needs to be shifted to the next column. One of the pieces that this does in the desired results is this is a document that begins um, in partnership with the administration to really look at and make sure that as we move forward, and this particular um, next step, Vicki Byer will come to the table and talk about in terms of where it fits with the district wellness policy, for example, really is to put up those guardrails and understand not only the why, but also to really understand where the board has that vision to go and then also in, in that same kind of um, conversation, the places we don't go so that we have a very clear understanding of how we move forward. Our question for the recess policy is what are the key principles shared by the Board of Education that will guide the development of the recess goal currently found in the district wellness policy into a recess policy and or rule? So that's the, the recess policy and Vicki's here to talk about it and invite others. But again, this is a document, this is a document that can be amended this is a document for board input so that we have really the, the framework to, to move forward with. So thank you for all your help on that. Thank you. We will be reconvening the district wellness committee with our first meeting towards the end of August. 
and one of the tasks that we will take on is bringing this document back to the committee for discussion and seeking input from all major stakeholders that would be impacted by any change to, or creation actually, of a policy. So my ask tonight is for the board to have discussion, um, suggestions on potential modifications to this draft that Christina and I would bring along with Lynette, who is going to co-facilitate along with uh, Tim Flood to the committee meeting. Thank you. I just want to point out, too, if you scroll to the second page under the, it will say the next steps, and that will outline uh, the three points of consideration that we're looking, um, we'll be looking at, which is uh, tw at least 20 minutes of recess per day, uh, not being able to withhold recess for punishment, and then holding recess prior to lunch when possible. So those are the three specific considerations. Um, and I do want to uh, thank everyone that was involved um, putting this this together. I think taking this to the uh, wellness team, the district wellness council, is exactly what the, the, the council was there to do. Um, I'm excited to kick that off with them and with you at the end of the month. Um, and I think what's really nice about this document is that it really um, outlines very specifically the why. The research is very robust around uh, these three sort of key pieces of recess. Um, it's submit, it's uh, supported by the CDC, by the APA, uh, by all the major players Shape America, which is the Health and Physical Education Professional Association for Health and PE. Um, so it, it's really clear, and I think there's really great uh, tools and toolkits out there in terms of the implementation of this, too, and that will really be the second key piece to this, It's especially with um, recess not being able to be used as or taken away as um, as punishment I think that's a really important piece for teachers right it's it's if that's not an option anymore then giving um, other options that are uh, in support of the whole child in replacement of that so that they feel supported in their professional development and their creativity in the classroom so I look forward to having uh, more conversations around that Um, for transparency purposes, uh, can we speak to who is on the wellness committee? Yes, we're still in the um, recruitment phase, but I can tell you um, the titles of the people that we're looking for. Um, Tim Flood and Lynette will be facilitating. I will be support along with uh, Ms. Shelton as the board rep. From teaching and learning, uh, we're seeking either Dr. Khan or uh, Mr. Freeze. Uh, elementary school administrator, middle school administrator, high school administrator, and then a K-8 administrator. Representation from the physical education, health, and family and consumer science team, teachers. School food service staff, school nurse, Mr. Flood has reached out to the ICSC leadership to get student representation. The family engagement coordinators are seeking parents to participate. Uh, membership from the pupil services team. College career and community ready uh, team. So um, either Amy Fish or Kim Shanick would support us. Facilities will have a representative, human resources, a registered dietitian, and a member uh, leadership from GBEA. Do you have a recommendation for? Um, you might have covered it, but I just want it to be noted. Um, so anyone that, uh, I guess, specializes as in emotional behavior disabilities. Right. That was the? Yes, ma'am. What about teachers? GBEA, and then we also are seeking physical education, health education, and family and consumer science teachers. Okay. Okay. I just think if teachers are going to be um, and I, I firmly believe that recess is critical, but I also know that there are situations where not as a means of punishment, but a student may not be at that moment in time recess ready. 
and I don't want to bind teachers' hands by saying absolutely not, you cannot withhold recess, I think there needs to be alternatives. And I also would like to see teachers having alternatives of incorporating um, physical activity during the course of the teaching. I think, so I think, you know, rather than just the, the specialists that you identified, I think you need the people who are in the trenches to be part of that. Sure. You're correct. Um, part of this process will involve the committee really cleaning this up and, and having something prepared to have teachers provide feedback on. So our hope is to work with Dr. Stramp on some type of survey, and we would include the teacher voice. I understand that's very important, and thank you for recognizing that. There might be times when a student might not be ready to have recess with their peers, but we can come up with alternatives, as Ms. Sheldon mentioned. Right. Parents to, to right. Parents. Because depending on how they view that. Yeah, I, my, my comments were going to be similar. What? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, my comments were going to be similar. I mean, I, I don't think we'll ever have anyone sit in front of us who says we don't want more recess for our kids. Motion is important. All, all of that. If that person's here, maybe I do want to talk to them. Um, but uh, just thinking about that, that punishment piece and um, not wanting to micromanage our teachers, um, certainly don't want recess to be taken away as a punitive um, you know, punishment, but also understanding the, the, the learning outcomes. And if there's a student who's not participating in the learning, um, the, if that student was not allowed to go to recess to make up that learning, the student would look at it as a punishment. Um, but to the teacher, it's, hey, I need to, you to make up this work. You know, so th it's a slippery slope, and I don't want to get into hypotheticals because we could talk about a thousand situations. So um, I'd be curious to hear how, um, with the GBA and, and other reps, how, how we can resolve that to, to have it be yes and, not yes but. And I'll respond to that by saying I think it's really important that it, this committee will look at the brain science about how physical activity and learning is connected because I think that's exactly right. And when we think about this issue, really sort of reframing it from, um, you know, that that if you're, not that you're saying this, but this is kind of where it goes, right? That if you are in recess that you're not learning, rather saying yes, and if you're in recess, you're preparing the brain for learning, right? So all of this, we'll get into the semantics of it, but I think that's really where it becomes interesting for us as a district to say, why is it important and to be able to use that common language so that it's a philosophy of our culture and climate of our school. Yeah, I mean, I look at uh, sometimes you're a great example of this during board meetings when you need to move, you know, you stand up, you move, you got to wiggle because we've been, you know, and kids feel that way in their desks too. Now, if you stand up and do that, everyone thinks, oh, Christine is self-regulating. And if a child does that in the classroom, it can be viewed as, hey, why aren't you, you know, so... Um, all, all stuff I know you guys are talking about, we're saying the same thing. I love that the conversation is happening and uh, it's all about finding the best way to support kids. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to the, the product of more discussion. I can, I can tell you it's, uh, it is a hard line for me that we have a, a policy that recess cannot be taken away as a punishment because it's that that break often is what might get a kid to not only because it might be the break that would get a kid to calm down and prevent further problems but that's part of why I get concerned when I hear people talk about makeup work that that lines will and, and I, I understand there's there's a small there there's a, I'm sure most teachers aren't doing this Anyways, but also I, I know of cases where people other than teachers have been involved in a de facto taking away of recess as punishment, of um, non-certified staff making classes stand against a wall for an entire, an entire recess. Um, I want, which, and that's taking away recess if, so... I've said it loud, loud and clear here, and I, I bet no one would disagree with me, that, if that that is, I would expect if someone did that to a group of kids, that that would be treated as the policy violation that it is, and they can't say, well, technically, they I didn't make them go in, so it's not 
recess. Um, I, I want there to be a, so I, I would like to see those practices be uh, strictly prohibited. That does not mean that a kid who shouldn't be having recess the same exact way and time as other kids, if the way a kid has been spending his recess is to hurt other kids on the playground, then maybe their recess will look different, and I totally get that, and that's not taking away recess. But academic makeup, I think, is a, such a, a slippery slope that it could be used all the time by anyone who wanted to take a kid's recess away. There's probably some missing work that you could be making a kid do, probably. I And so I would like to send a, a clear message on this. And also, if there's still a practice anywhere of a recess being taken away as a group punishment, my view is that I think that should be considered not just a violation of policy, but a serious violation of of policy so that's that's where i stand and i hope that makes the those things make the cut which would then allow me to vote for the final document yes so she raised her hand first <laughs> i'm with you on that andrew um i think we all know that um, kids today are experiencing more mental health issues more trauma than ever before and if we're really going to commit to the whole child we have to commit to the whole child um, the society of health and physical educators which is shape america uh, they serve as the voice for 200,000 health and physical education professionals across the nation um, they're renowned for for their work with educators they recommend that recess is a necessary break in the day for optimizing a child's social emotional physical and cognitive development in, this, in essence, recess should be considered a child's personal time and it should not be withheld for academic or punitive reasons. So there's a lot of recommendations from people who basically live and breathe this that I think we hopefully will be looking at when we um, form a policy. Thank you. Um, along the lines of punishment with recess and taking away the bomb things, Something that I know that happened when I was in elementary school, it's been a long time since then, but if being prepared or... <laughs> um, along the lines of not being prepared about for reasons, I know that um, I went to Martin Elementary, and if we didn't have our boots for, if we had tennis shoes for recess during the wintertime, we were not allowed off little patios. If we did not have, like, a full winter gear, we weren't allowed on like the actual like ground to play with snow. So it wouldn't technically be considered taking away a kid's recess, but allowing people to have like the resources to, if, even if it's just asking the community to bring in boots or something so that the kids who may not have the boots or may not have or may have forgotten them can still have that time to run around and exercise because that they aren't meaning to have the recess taken away, but that is happening. Yeah. We'll be accepting feedback. Uh, the committee meets the last week of August. So if any board member would like to share feedback on the document before that, we'd appreciate it. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, the dress code guiding change document. And I do have someone in the audience who's interested in participating just to, to give you a heads up. We will hear the presentation and discuss it and then invite you up for comments as was explained on this paper if that's okay audra okay good Thank you. dr wagon is coming up to the wegan wegan gosh i do it every time you i'm do. terribly sorry to talk about the dress code policy and um, again a guiding change to frame the conversation and i know you've uh, been very engaged i know mr becker the uh, part of the leadership team from ICSC has been intricately involved as well, and Mr. Magus, so. Sure, so as we uh, noted with the last guiding change, this is meant as a document that is to frame our work related to what is our vision for what we want the, uh, the final product to look like, what is our current reality, and then in the middle, what are the things that would be unacceptable. So um, Dr. Wiegan has done work with the ICSC members as well as others taking input from administration. Mm -hmm. We 
heard loud and clear that the students at the ICSC felt that they wanted a change and we have been receptive to that. Uh, we also want to make sure that the change takes into account what are the needs of the school, what are the needs of the administration, what are the needs of the teachers as stakeholders. Not that we want to discount student voice. Student voice is extremely important, but we want to make sure that as we move forward, we're moving forward in a way that is comprehensive and uh, coherent and cohesive based on all those needs of the different stakeholders. Dr. Wiegand? Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so this last school year during um, the ICSC meeting, the um, officers came forward and shared that there were certainly some concerns regarding consistency become in the different buildings on dress code, where some buildings allowed hats and hoods, other buildings didn't. And so I did a very um, quick survey um, with our assistant principals at the secondary level, and that was confirmed by their survey results that we do have um, some buildings that do allow hats and hoods and so forth, um, where others do not. Um, and so we wanted to bring forward, um, as Mr. Magus mentioned, um, at least the start of this guiding change piece, where we talk uh, the question last time the dress code was revised and approved was 2008. What changes are needed to reflect the social and cultural clothing trends as well as the needs of stakeholders in 2019-20? So I had the um, pleasure of meeting with our um, ICSC officers for 1920, along with um, Melissa Thiel-Collar and um, Dr. Langfeld um, spent some time with us as well. So I'll go over the document, but I also want Noah to jump in, okay, um, during this piece of it. So again, our current reality is that there's inconsistency in how the dress code policy is currently um, being implemented at our different buildings. So we started to brainstorm using this document about the not how of the decision making pr process. So what do we not want to see? So we uh, policy that does not reflect the current social and cultural clothing trends as well as the needs of stakeholders a policy that results in cultural bias when considering hats, hoods, and other head coverings, a policy that cannot be consistently enforced. Um, some of the things we talked about, coats, um, should they be allowed because of the varying temperatures in buildings? Is outdoor attire really a safety risk? Um, does not take into account issues of safety and security for students and staff. We touched a little bit about backpacks in middle school. Um, we also talk a policy that results in, results in cultural bias when considering hats, hoods, and other head coverings. And then a policy that cannot be equitably applied based on gender. And so some of our conversation um, with the officers was about that um, one example was that, um, and she, and Hannah's not here this evening, but she had emailed me just a little while ago to clarify it's not during gym class, but it's during um, sports practice where um, Guys or gentlemen are allowed to take their shirt off if they're out running and so forth, but if a girl is um, just as hot, if she wants to take her shirt off and has a sports bra, she is not allowed by the coach to do so. So is that a gender bias by having that standard? Also, girls not being allowed to wear spaghetti strap tops, tank tops, um, but yet boys tend to be able to wear those type of, um, that type of clothing. Is that pretty much accurate where we're at? Um, and then so then we talked about what would an ideal school dress code policy look like and again we just started um, brainstorming about removing outdoor attire, allowing hats and hoods with the caveat that face and ears need to be seen, um, a, something that's gender neutral, possibly allowing tank tops, spaghetti straps, bare shoulders, um, sport bras and athletics if boys are allowed to be shirtless. Still trying to look at language that would um, still talk about appropriate undergarments. So again, still very early in the process. So we are at the point of going and getting more stakeholder um, input. So the officers are going to be going out to meet with the principals in their quads. So I know, Nora, you're gonna be meeting with um, Ms. Jacobson and then the co-principals at Franklin. And then um, Luke is going to be meeting with um, the Southwest Quad, um, high school, and then Lombardi Principal, and then as well as East and Washington, and then Hannah will do Preble and Edison. So at least get some stakeholder input from our major, um, our 
for middle schools and for high schools. We still need to take a look at possibly Red Smith and other schools as well. But again, to reach out and get input from the principals, as well as as the principals, how can they get input then from faculty and staff? The students, this will be on the agenda for the ICSC meeting that's coming up in at their first meeting in September. And then we're also going to um, work with Dr. Langenfeld to see if she has an upcoming parent advisory meeting to possibly get on there to um, get some input from parents. So those are our next steps when we will come back together as a committee on September 11th to talk about some of the information that we've gathered. So that's where we're at at this point in time. Thank you, Judy. Um, one of the things that I, I feel like is different about this document from the recess is for me, and maybe I'm missing this, for me the why column in recess was very clear about why we need a recess policy. And I think one of the things I'd like to hear coming out of this work is why do we need a dress code policy? Because that why provides the foundation for the what, mm -hmm. right? And if if there is a, and, and that why needs to be connected to re, re, research, right, reality. So if, if we say it's safety and security, then I'd like to be able to understand how that actually links. In my mind, I can make up ideas, but it would be good for us to sort of go, I think, a little bit more deeply in that. The other thing, too, is, and I will just speak for myself, self, because that's all I can do, I would like to see a dress code policy that really is very simple and to me, the only thing that I feel like is really needs to be enforced, that really can be enforced, is uh, you know, clothing that has um, graphic images of violence and, and language. All the other pieces, to me, it gets so nuanced with clothing that you can really spend so much time in a wormhole. But that why, for me, I would love to learn more about your philosophy on that moving forward. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Rhonda. So, when we're thinking about going forward and creating another policy, when we look at the existing policy right now, it's not, there's not a lot of, there's a few things in there, but some of the concerns that came forward to the board last year from Audra, a student at Franklin, M. Gabrielson, which is, um, thank you for that, because she actually kind of got this thing in motion. Um, and she I, will And she will, and I'm so excited to hear from her. Um, but I, I that, you know, to me, she was instrumental in, in bringing this forward, and, and it's how great is that that we have a student voice who's driving this change, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, but I think what's important is, and what she touched in her, on, in her email, she talked about how there is a policy, but then there are a lot of, there's a lot of autonomy when it comes to building principles, and there was never really much you could find in print. Um, it was, a lot of it was discussed at the beginning of the school year about the specifics around um, straps for tank tops and, and outerwear and whatnot. And so when we're looking at the timeline of this and we're thinking about, you know, we're, what are we, a month away from school starting? I'd like some clarification on, because I do have concerns about, I'm, I'm very happy that we're considering all these things, um, but I'm also concerned about we have school starting in a month. And so we have, you know, are, are we going to go and talk about all of this? It's is an existing policy, but there's still a lot of autonomy when it comes to principals and their buildings. And when we talk about, um, you know, hats, hoods, the, the straps, it's, it's really more, from what I've been hearing, it's not even so much about I want to take my shirt off because we all know in society I, we can't do that as women and, and I don't think we're going to be asking for that. It's more about what is the message we're sending girls? Are we, are we body shaming them because we see their shoulders? Or maybe they wear bras. We know this, right? Um, and you might have a bra strap peek out. So my concern is are we starting the school year off with still having this existing practice and policy in place, and those messages are still going out there. So I'm not sure even what the answer is to that, but is it they, we meet, we get some feedback, and then after Christmas, guess what? We have a new dress code policy and practice, and so I'm not sure what the conversation looks like with building principles 
prior to school starting around this because we are considering it, but as to your point, we're considering it for reasons. Do we believe the reasons today? Or are we, because it's, it's an interesting message to send, we're considering this, but it's not ready to go yet for school starting. So I'm just, I'm concerned about what that's gonna look like and how that's gonna roll out. Thank you for the feedback. And we have uh, been working with the ICSC and part of it was that we wanted to make sure that we had full input from, from all stakeholders. There is a timeline piece to that. And we have left within our, our handbooks uh, a degree of, of um, possibility for change within the year and we'd want to make sure that was reiterated. I think as well that having the conversation beginning will um, allow principals to have deeper reflection on this. If, if we're moving away from things for and I, I would hate to, to discover that there were that there were situations in which cultural attire was not uh, allowed the same discretion as, for, for various cultures but if there was something of that nature and we were beginning to have more dialogue around it I would want to make sure that that was something that was an aware awareness builder I do feel that uh, we our, our current dress code we would we do make sure that there is um, adherence with our current policy and again, there are, when, when it comes to the why, I think that the simple why is we want kids to be able to have the degree of freedom in the way that they dress so that they can express themselves, so that they can uh, be who they are. Yet we also, some, there are certain aspects related to safety that we have to be, be careful about. You know, having flip-flops in a tech ed room might not be safe, for instance. We have to think about, uh, you know, of course, like you said, we, we can't have nudity or things of that nature that would that would allow for uh, distraction in the classroom or, or violation of law or things of that nature. So that's part of the why. But I think really the, the basis of the why and why our ICSC students want this considered largely is because they want to be able to express themselves and clothing is part of their identity and we want to make sure that we're allowing for breadth within that, that framework. Um, because she's probably going to speak to that. Um, um, no, just. Okay. I just. I'd like to get a reference. This is, but this is our. Is this our opportunity to speak to this, or isn't it? This right. This is, and there is opportunity to speak. After right, but after when you talk, I just want to say, okay. Every meeting I get cut off. This is. Yeah, I'm just saying that. No, you're it's. Keep every, Audra and she's here to. And I'm herself. going to. I'm so excited that she's here, and and. I actually am very happy about that. Um, but it is important to note that words matter and distraction is something that I think in 2019 we have to think about using different words. And I think that's an important point. Thank you for letting me make that. Audra Quick, come on up. Audra Gabrielson. And if you wanna bring another chair up please, John. Sure. And I agree, we have to be careful about the definition of distraction. If somebody wears a 15 foot tall hat, that might be something that would be something that would be preventing uh, people from be able, being able to see, but we do have to make sure that we're careful about that because one person's definition of distraction can be an encroachment on somebody's cultural norms, and we want to make sure. I'm telling could you please? Could you please stage your back off, Judy? Thank you. <laughs> Only one of these can work at a time. So every time she pushes her button, she cuts me off. Gets ugly. If you could please state your full name and address, and then address the board. Thank you. Hi, my name is Audra Gabrielson. I live at 875 Hubbard Street, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, I am a student at Franklin Middle School, and I, to go with the dress code, it's not documented in the um, district handbook and I'm still told that I need to follow it, and I couldn't find anywhere. I had to email my principal 
about what the code was because I couldn't find it. And um, something that I found within what I was told about the code was the unfairness towards women. And like was said that we're told that our bodies are distracting. Um, like right now I'm wearing a spaghetti strap top, but I'm wearing a skirt with it too. And it, it looks presentable. I, I don't feel like I am like drawing attention away from the matter at hand by being, by representing who I am and just like showing my identity and this is how I express myself. Um, something that I wrote in a letter to the board a few, like last year in November, I actually said that I found in my school code was unfair and it's not just unfair to women, it is also unfair to them the men that go to my school, because it assumes a lot about who they are as well. It's not just something that affects me. Um, I have friends here, they're not here, they couldn't make it today, um, but they agree with me on this, that it's not just unfair to the women, it is also unfair to the men at our school, because by saying that our bodies are distracting, it is also saying that they can't control themselves. And it's raising them to believe that women's bodies are distracting. And like was said, distracting has different meanings to different people. And we, I feel like, would be needed to have a more cut and dry term. I um, also found that it wasn't really fair to other cultures as well, because they have different body types that, that they come from different like racial backgrounds that accentuate different body types and saying things at my school specifically that are like you can't wear tank tops because your shoulders are distracting that isn't really fair to the cultures because of the body types or at my school I'm told that if I have my hands at my side and my hands flat and I'm standing up straight I have to have my shorts go past my fingertips and that it's hard to find I I'm from a middle class family and I shop at like Target and stuff, like normal places to go for, in my opinion. Um, I can't find shorts that are that length. When I stand up, it goes about to the edge of my skirt. This is the longest skirt that I own and like one of the only, I don't wear skirts often. Normally I wear shorts because in summer it's very hot. In May it was 90 and I was still in school and I couldn't wear spaghetti straps and shorts because I was told that it wasn't fair to the men in my class. And I was only told this once throughout the school year. At the very beginning, at a dress code fashion show that was only at Middle School Matters. Um, in my letter, I also stated that it isn't just my school where these are the rules that we're told. It is also places like Aldo Leopold, West High, East High, and Lombardi. I, those are, as well as Preble, which was only found in a newsletter that was a reminder, and it wasn't really written anywhere else for Preble. All of these places are like Franklin, where they do not have the documentation. And what I found is that there is a line in the district code that says principals may make exceptions as necessary, but they seem to have made additions. Um, I also have a story, one of my friends, she was, I, I believe it was gym class, and she was told that her shoulders were being distracting to young men. She was told this by a male teacher, and that uh, that kind of speaks to the argument as well that was like shoulder, I've found arguments out there that are like, the shoulders are also going to be distracting to the male teachers, and that assumes that the male teachers are pedophiles almost, and um, that they're looking at their students' bodies in a sexual way, and that's not something that I want at my school, and I would feel comfortable with at my school. I 
I, I believe I've hit all my points. The sexualizing of children, the racial um, implications and economic implications. May I say some, oh, sorry, some points that agree with her? So when she's talking about the length of the skirts, I am 5'10", and to find shorts that, or anything perhaps in the style of nowadays for me to stand up and put my hands down is very hard. And with um, people to like the, saying that our shoulders are distracting, I've seen many earrings and belts that are distracting, but it only comes a problem when it comes to our shoulders or to the straps that we wear. Plus, when I, I have multiple, I have friends from a vi like variety of different ethnic cultures and racial backgrounds, and it's only a select few who I've noticed have been the ones to get the dress codes. For example, um, I am clearly white, and I have some friends of different ethnic ethnicities, and one day we decided to both wear a top that it only went up to here, and it showed our shoulders. Um, and my friend of a different ethnicity um, was dress coded, and I was not. And so that may be, um, go along with the different backgrounds and stuff, but it is the term distraction that you used um, before. It is, it is a problem because like the way that we are built and the way that we just need, like we are, is, shouldn't be a distraction. So, yeah. Thank you. Andrew. Yeah, to, to me, the, the issue of, uh, Distraction. I, I remember a um, poster I saw in a school of a different nearby school district, and like they had a under they correctly categorized under distracting outfits like a picture of someone in a uh, Gumby costume. Okay, that is uh, that is inappropriate unless it's a special day because it's distracting probably. Um, but they're you know. It's just, it's really disappointing to me that I, I guess I thought maybe that if someone was literally saying that the shoulder is a distraction and that somehow the shoulder, uh, your shoulder being visible was like implication that that is sexual. And it sounds like it actually happens a lot and has said literally that your shoulders are a distraction and that I'm, that makes me very upset. And what that does, what that does too, is that really weakens the statement that in rare circumstances someone might have to make if they're wearing a type of, of clothing that leaves them in a unsafe situation or something, which that's none of none of what I'm hearing about. I'm hearing about the, the shoulder or uh, strap being a, a distraction and it's I'm I'm embarrassed that it's gone this long before before we've gotten to this point, but it's a lot of things are going on. I'm glad we're there now. And um I'll be looking forward to a document where we don't where it would really say in there that you're gonna be talking to your supervisor if you tell someone that the your shoulder being visible is a distraction to the opposite sex. Um, I don't know if I have anything else to add to this conversation. I love that it's happening, but uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that one thing that I take away from this is how impressed I am by by our, all of our students that are taking part in this conversation and just how well you represent yourselves and uh, very proud uh, to have students in our district that can stand up and think for themselves and, and, and speak out. So thank you for, for being a part of this. And I know there's more. Oh, sorry. And I just wanted to say to Audra's point where you had talked about students from other schools that uh, when you do the survey that we maybe we do need to include Aldo, we do need to include Red Smith, we need to include Dewey and NEW just to get the full um, impact of students. Noah. I did it right. Okay, so what, can you elaborate, what exactly did you find when you had to go on this goose chase to actually get anything in writing? 
Um, the only things I found, I found a newsletter from Preble that was a reminder that as warm weather approaches, there's a certain length for skirts that women must wear. And I actually had to write an email to my principal in order to find any written evidence of a dress code at my school. I couldn't find one in the student handbook I was given at the beginning of the year. It appeared that a page had been ripped out. Um, we weren't certain, but my parents and I had assumed that that was maybe a dress code page that we had to like sign and return or something because that's common in the handbooks that we have to sign and return things. But we could not find any written evidence besides that one newsletter that was from Preble and the email that I had to basically, I had, I had to question my principal of a dress code in order to find any written form. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's there's information here that I just never saw. Um, I, I guess there's it's easy to miss. It, for me, it was pretty easy to miss a lot of that because I just wasn't the target of it. So, um, yeah, these are things I'd like to bring to the ICSC and pro and have more discussion. And there was some things thrown around about um, timeline earlier. So yeah, I hope that this can all get discussed um, at the Intercity Student Council. And I guess I should probably do a better job on my end of making sure that uh, all students know that they can go to those under current policy. So if people want to come talk to the ICSC, they can do that there as well. Um, so another thing to look into Noah, which I'd love your perspective and yours as well, being students, and I had heard this from Edison, some Edison students as well, that some of the presentations that were given at the beginning of the school year varied widely, and there was also some, some deep racialized uh, language and, and pictures that were used, and, and maybe you can speak to that. So I'd love if you guys could investigate that a little bit more, talk to other fellow students, and really think about the variances there and how we can do a better job. Um, as a, I went to Edison myself, and even when I was there, we were shown things like presentations like that in the beginning of the school year, and I think that definitely needs to stop. Also, I think adding into our discussion is like the fact that we can't show our shoulders, but we can wear leggings, which are form-fitting, super tight, and that is not a problem whatsoever. But as soon as we show something that has absolutely nothing to do with anything, it's a wide problem. So. First of all, thank you for coming forward and having this important discussion. Um, as a woman and a mother and grandmother of women, I, I think it's an important, critical discussion that we have, especially as, as change has gone over time, to really engage in this uh, really critically. One of the pieces, and it actually, uh, Ms. Shelton and Christina, really fits with what you were saying. and. Um, Dr. Began and I, Judy and I have already talked about Edison. We've heard about that. But I would like to really have a clear understanding of what the presentations are to, to students. Mm -hmm. I know that some are highly engaging and actually really tell a nice um, story and afford students the ability to, to really question. I know some schools, so I think it's very different and the approach is different in each and every school. So I think that that would be really critically important. I think the other piece, and I would, I would offer this to the students, in the guiding change document um, that was uh, addressed earlier, a couple of things are in there. I want to make sure we don't lose sight of what was in those minutes too because there's, there's whys in there, so maybe flesh those out. And then the other piece that I know that's in there is, is really looking at the social and cultural trends and the needs. You know, I think we have, if you're, you know, at Preble, we hear often that some of the rooms are mighty chilly. And so those kinds of things, I don't, Franklin used to be really chilly before the referendum from what I can recall. But I wanna make sure that the comfort level is really important just as we had a great conversation about food if you're freezing or too hot, it's really hard to think, right? And so that's really important is, is how do we address the layers and things that make it more comfortable. So I wanna thank you for, for coming forward. I assume then as students who wish to get engaged in this conversation and those groups that, that everyone who has a voice and, and really wants to weigh in should have that opportunity and I'm sure you've got that 
um, in the plan as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Anything else? Yes. Oh, sorry, Rhonda. Okay. Um, the Edison Edge, that's what that is. It's a slideshow. I, I've seen it. I went into a classroom, was invited in, and um, happily went in and was able to um, have students go through it with me and show me their specific issues that they were having with it, um, which was you know, really enlightening to, to hear from them. Um, but I think Audra, so you, you're referring to, um, because my daughter's at Franklin as well, and it is the presentation where you hear the the rules, the guidelines, it's it's spoken to you, and then there's there hasn't been anything to refer back to. Correct. Uh, the presentations, they're all verbal. I, I, there is a visual aspect to it, um, but it's not like a recorded visual aspect, like a slideshow or a PowerPoint. It is a, what was called a dis, um, dress code fashion show, and they like would model all of the things that you couldn't wear and you could wear. And there was, there was this one that really stuck out to me. It had to do with the shorts. This girl was wearing je denim shorts and they, they probably went to about here on her. And she had to wear like undershorts to go with the shorts. And watching that, I was like, I can't imagine that that's comfortable. And I can't imagine it was easy to find because I couldn't find anything that would fit underneath shorts that I'm already wearing or that would be breathable in the slightest on in months like this past May where it was really hot and it was, it was 90. It was bad. <laughs> There is, we were just, I'd asked Michelle to look up the student handbook, and on page 33, there is something that addresses student dress. It's the policy. It's the policy. It's the policy. It states the policy. But it's not what they're told. What they're it's told. not what you're told. No. So it's inconsistent. Right. But that. Okay. It's important to me. All right. I have. Thank you, Brenda. So I'm looking at the survey from the high school and middle school principals, mm -hmm. and um, looks like we have a couple that um, allow the question. What was you told me this when I asked you? The question was regarding, hoods. Headgear. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I thought. So this is regarding headgear, um, mm -hmm. and and actually that's um, I think from people that have talked with me. <clears throat> more of a sticky piece than the what we've been talking about with, with the um, female dress code. And I'm curious, when you see that there are um, six to eight principals at the high school and five at the middle school that do not allow hoods and hats, how many of them are doing that because they're really good rule followers? Or how, and how many are doing that and are going to have difficulty adjusting to if we relax the rules on hoods and hats. So the purpose of that initial survey was just to kind of get a general feel. So as we continue to have those conversations with our principals, as well as getting input from faculty and staff, that'll certainly have to be discussed. Okay, mm -hmm. so you don't mm -hmm. have a sense no. of, okay, that's mm -hmm. something that you're going to be working There's, on. Yes, okay. yes. All right. Because I think that that's the, to, to me, the, the concern I hear is the ability to recognize mm -hmm. kids in a, mm -hmm. in a, you know, in a second. Mm -hmm. So if you see them in the hall, um, you know, you should be able to see their face. If they're mm -hmm. in a classroom, you should, you should um, also be able to see their ears, which is the, on the intercity student council yes. list of things. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Because because if kids can hide behind a hood, then they have earbuds yes. and, and, you know, uh, talking on phones and, mm -hmm. or not talking probably, but, um, but uh, um, and so that's, to, that's been more of the concern that I've heard. Um, and so that'll be something mm -hmm. that yes, will be, it will be interesting to see how you work through that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that'll be more difficult than the, I agree. Then the shorts and the spaghetti I agree. Yeah, I agree. straps and things mm -hmm. like that. Yes. 
Actually, no, I have this lined up. All right, so this is probably more failure on my end to listen, um, but can can you just, just for everyone's sake, give like the general timeline, uh, just read that back to us sort of, of what the general timeline is of eventually getting a policy to the board table? I don't have that document in front of me. I know that we're putting that together. So that we can get the um, feedback that we have by September 11th. So based on that, we could probably, in working with Melissa Thiel Collar, um, and our superintendent regarding a draft. But I can't commit to that timeline, okay. And then as I recall, that timeline that we got a few months ago said that um, October was, October, early be. November was when the policy would come to us sure. and for mm -hmm. approval, yeah. I believe so. And then did we um, put something in the communication, or I mean, I, I assume people will know that this is being worked on and, and um, it'll be a transition in terms of yes. getting to November. Yes, most definitely. Okay. Is that, because um, I was looking at the expectation book, is that they're in? Oh, they're not online? That was last year's? Okay, thanks. All right. I thought we were going to do that. I just want to clarify, though, Brenda, to go back to your point, because even covering your ears is not something that we necessarily can enforce. If we have people who are wearing a hijab, their ears are going to be covered. So, and I just say that that's where the nuances of this really gets is, you know, again, why do we have to do it? And it becomes, you know, as we go down this rabbit hole, how do you enforce these things when it really becomes about what makes people feel comfortable? To go back to your point, Andrew, if somebody wants to dress like Gumby, every day and that's what makes them feel happy and that's what they're going to be able to show up and do their best at school i really don't care to I, I, Gumby's head would block but you. and i understand that you have to think about the people around you but what i'm simply saying though is we want our kids to come and feel great about who they are and to show up and be the best and to feel that they're representing themselves and the more we try to micromanage and sort of draft language that fits into what it, the more you do that, the more you're going to not be inclusive because it's impossible to create language that fits everybody, but rather to say, how do we sort of create a broad policy that allows people to cover their ears if they need to, but at the same time allows us to create spaces where kids can be successful. So how we do that is the work, but even something as simple as keeping your ears open is not simple. Um, so along the lines of covering your ears, um, uh, you made a comment about listening to music or taking phone calls during class. Um, AirPods are becoming very um, Bluetooth headphones, and I know a variety of people, boys and girls who have long hair, who are successfully able to hide them during class. So there's... <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, um, yeah, so there's definitely ways, like, I don't know if you've ever seen people, people put their headphones up their sleeves and just sit here like this and can listen to music. So there's a variety of ways to get around li not being able to use your earbuds and everything. So I think that that's going to be a little trickier than to just be like, you need to not have your ears covered. So. I know what you're saying about trying to keep a policy that's generally not, that doesn't have many words in it because then you don't get as new and there are fewer problems. But I think we just heard what happens when you have a policy that doesn't have enough words in it. You get principals who, uh, see, and I, that's what I've been, try I've been trying to say, like, how can we keep it where we're not, like, writing a whole constitution about um, dress code while still keeping um, keeping away from exactly what we we just heard happens that I had no idea I didn't know that the that some schools went so in depth with the dress code especially on points that I consider to be nonsensical in my own opinion but how, like I think that's a big part of how do we balance this um, but I I think if you write a policy that's too short you get what we just heard which goes back to what Christina talked about, where the why isn't, isn't there's really not a lot there. Um, what does the research tell us about safety with hats, hoods? Um, do we have, you know, 
an ample amount of kids who are failing school because they have, all of a sudden we found that they had um, earbuds in their ears. We've created, it feels like we've created policies and, and practices with really not a lot of research to drive that. So to your point, Brenda, about the, the concerns that the principals have, I'm assuming they must have some research material to, to provide to, um, to to address those concerns. Um, so I'm hoping that that is the why is really what this is about. Thank you. Michelle? I have an ask um, as we think forward with our principals. One of the things, and Audrey, you brought it up, is I believe you did, about the fact that what you're told, as I'm reading the student dress code policy, the policy may or may not align with what is shared with students. And I think that's an important conversation with principals because at the end of the day, if you're told um, more specific detail behind that, how does a student, you can't have them go reference if there's some additional information that has been you know, shared out. So I, I would I would offer that there appears to be a significant disconnect some in some places. I don't know. Just what I've heard doesn't necessarily match the policy. So even having that conversation might be um, important. I, I would say not might is important as we start a new school year. Yeah, and that can be done well before any policy changes. Thank you. Andrea, were you planning on staying for the entire meeting? <laughs> just, just asking. I don't want to take advantage of your good nature, but I'm just. And and we would love to have you. <laughs> we would love to have you. I promise. If we just go to food service, quick, get them up here. Oh, all right. Come on up, Andrea. Oh, well then, please do. And I appreciate your allowing other people to uh, to go ahead. I tried. I tried, Lynette and Amanda, I tried. As Andrea comes up, uh, we're sharing our Achievement Gap Reduction Report. And this is, there, there were, there was one, uh, Minor mistake in the, the reporting that uh, was, was seen with the Jefferson report, but we can clarify that information. We'll clarify yep. that. And presenting our report in brief yes. for any questions. I'm sorry. I will need a little tutorial here. Which button do I push? Thank you very much. Um, what John is referring to in the achievement gap reduction is that a board member did email me um, last night and asked about the math for kindergarten. Um, it stated in Jefferson that it was from the early literacy assessment, not the STAR math assessment. So STAR does both a early literacy and a reading, and then they also do a math. Our kindergarten students take STAR early literacy that has a math domain. Within that math domain um, is where our kindergartners get uh, the data. Um, from and um, it is on numeracy, but it is embedded within the early literacy. So it wasn't an error; it was just a misunderstanding in how what data we use. But that that is when you look at the report that is for all kindergarten. So the AGR report, Achievement Gap Reduction Report, is a report that we've given for the last three years. Um, this is our third year that we have used the NCE with the support of Dr. Gwen Stromp. Um, are there any questions at this time? Questions? 
Thank you very much for your time. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, also, our school leaders um, would love for you to come into their schools and talk with them about their data, both curriculum. You are welcome. Huge shout out to Dr. Gwen Stromp, who actually has been working with our technology department to make that report happen. So thank you, Gwen. Thank you very much. I've known your 74-page report was going to be <laughs> summarized in a few minutes. I wouldn't have reordered things. But have a good vacation. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Andrea. All right. That concludes teaching and learning. Thanks, Katie. Do we need a break? I do. All right. Let's just take a, <clears throat> as short a break as we can. We already have one board member to pick one, so we'll all go. For one minute. One minute. No, wait. What? Did she leave? Could you pass that down to Sandy? Because she has great handwriting. She's an architect. Very well spoken. Hi, Heather. The gumby head would get in the way. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, organizational support. Uh, we convene the organizational support work session. Our first item is is board meeting postings, and we do have a public. Is he still here, though? Yeah. Oh, there he. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, I thought it was the guy at the back Do we do that first, table. or is there a presentation, well, or do we see if there's a presentation, and then we have? We're going to have to suspend the rules for public discussion because um, I forgot that we didn't have public discussion on this one. We had decided that since we weren't voting, that this was discussion. But, um, but yes, he's but so, move to suspend ahead. the rules. There a second. Oh, sorry, you're in charge, oh. Andrew. Um, yeah, there. Um, okay, so that so Katie, uh, you move to suspend the suspend the rules to allow public participation on this item. Is there a second? Second. Sandy. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sitnikau? Aye. Maloney? Aye. Warren? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Vanatumble? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Carried 7-0. Um, I, I have a few things to say regarding this. Is that, do you have anything? I, no, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay, and just have a discussion and then, um, and then call, and then sure. call the pu okay. public Go ahead. comment. So, um, let me find my notes here. Board member had requested this as a, uh, uh, Rhonda Sitnikau requested this as an agenda item um, through an email, and I was provided with information, let's see if this works. Oh, it did work. Um, it was provided with, with information about what we spend on, this is posting our meetings. And in general, and, and we, we have posted for a very long time with, with the Press Gazette, because it has been our only newspaper. And um, I would say in the, in the last four years, we've spent anywhere from 18, 19,000 up to we had a high of 25,000 in 16 17. The last two years we spent um, 18,000 in 17 18 and almost um, well, 18,800 last year. We do not have a contract with the Press Gazette, we pay them by the line uh, and they charge a dollar 15 cents per column line um, for, for the posting. And I know, I don't know, um, you know. 
we've had a request to post in the um, press times and the um, challenge with that is that they only publish once a week as, uh, at this point and that if we if we were posting in a publication that only publishes once a week it would make it difficult for um, for uh, scheduling things that we do more last minute as such as expulsion hearings or um, you know other meetings sometimes we have special board meetings uh, especially in the summer we've had some extra special board meetings and things like that but um, that's the information I have and at this point I would open it up and let anybody um, comment <coughs> Okay, Eric, do the, do the rules say that we have to, it has to be published in print? Yeah. Yes, it has to be. Melissa, I want you to come out. She knows the rules back and forth. Sandy does too, actually. The open records laws require you to, um, you can meet the posting requirements in various different ways. And one of them is by posting in print. Um, there's some other rules when it comes to various different meetings that you have to additionally post in three public places. So we designate City Hall, the library, and here at the district, those three public places. The postings have to be posted um, at least uh, 24 hours in advance, two hours in advance if there's an emergency. So we do do a number of postings during the week where we would not be able to use a, a weekly newspaper to meet those posting requirements. And, and we did look at that. We are open to make a re recommendation to the board for other print alternatives, but we have to be able to meet the needs of the law with respect to our postings. Just to clarify, you said, so it does require a posting in a print newspaper? You can choose to post, and I don't have it here in front of me. You can choose to post in three public places, or you can designate a newspaper as your official notice for your publication. Some things have to be published in the newspaper. In the newspaper, some things definitely have to be uh, published uh, in the newspaper, and some things have to be posted in three public places as well. We have chosen to meet the regular posting requirements through the newspaper and our website, and we don't always post in the three public places. Is that correct, Sandy? Rana? But an online version of the newspaper is not possible. So it has to be, I mean, you can actually be in the online version. So if, if there was uh, something out there that it's not necessarily that it's the print version, it's, you're saying print, but it's online version is possible as well. As long as it's a newspaper. I'm sorry, I have not research that question. I don't, I don't know what the Government Accountability Board, what their decision is on that. Um, I think it might be something to look into just in general for us because of, you know, there's so much going to online publication in general. Um, it's also good to note that um, Gannett and USA Today, it was announced that Gatehouse Media has acquired them. And do we know for sure that what we're paying right now and, and our the transaction that's between the district and the, the newspaper is going to stay the same considering the acquisition of the new of the company coming in? I think that would be something that I think we should get some answers to. So we can research the online. I know some things definitely have to be post published in print. And if if um, and we will research that, but even if with the acquisition, for us, it's meeting the legal requirements. So if the cost is going to go up and we're required to have uh, print, then then that's the cost. Again, a weekly newspaper, if we're required to post in print, is we are not going to be able to use that to comply with the posting requirements of the open record of the open meetings laws. Uh, but it is entirely possible we could put our minutes in there. We, di we discussed that, and the district, before Sandy or my time, has designated the Press Gazette as our official newspaper. So we, the board would have to take action then, I th probably to designate two newspapers as the official newspaper. And then that would be your decision with respect to where are you going to direct the public to. 
one me one newspaper for your postings and then another newspaper for your minutes or are you going to pay for both to have the minutes published in both newspapers Go ahead. I think uh, just as a good community partner, it would be nice to actually, if we do have two newspapers in the community, it would be nice to work with both um, potentially. Uh, I would say it would be interesting to see the minutes, the, the, the price minute wise, would it be worth it? Would we have a savings, cost savings um, to do minutes in one newspaper and then postings in another? I think just to see the numbers would be interesting. I'd be interested to see the numbers, to see what that looks like. And, and if the board directs us, we can certainly look at publishing in, in both, what that would look like and what the cost would be, and then the budget for that. Oh, yeah. Michelle? If I could add, um, and I'm not sure what that would mean for someone to do that if there's additional resource needed or work or time. That would be something, as long as we're putting it all together, that would be helpful um, if we're going to do multiples at the same time or something like that. Just wanting to make sure we have the whole picture for the board. Brenna? Did you have your hand? No. Okay. Sorry, I'm just sort of like. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Do we, are we required by law to, to post our minutes in print also? Okay. So it has to be somewhere in print, can't just be on our website. Okay. So my takeaways are to research whether we can um, meet the meeting notice requirements by posting in a newspaper online only, not in print version. And then um, we would need further information as to the cost of double posting um, minutes in two newspapers. Cost information is what you're looking for. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I wouldn't say double posting. Uh, I would say notices in one newspaper potentially, minutes in another. Yeah, I, I would be interested in that too. I, un I do understand that for notices because sometimes we have meetings and special meetings coming out quickly. They're single purpose, that we, but we it's an expulsion hearing or something. That's We have to get the notice out there because it has to start in open session before we're going to close. I get that. And to have people have only certain types of meetings be in the Press Gazette because they're last minute because we tried, that would be a real mess. But if all postings went into the the daily paper because they have the daily option and all minutes went out into a weekly paper because it's not so critical that it has to be on a given day. I think that could be valuable if it's cost effective. I'm I'm assuming but could be wrong. I'm I'm assuming that with the lack of daily paper competition we're probably kind of getting gouged here because you're if you're the only game in town um, so I would be interested in knowing the, the cost differential but I wouldn't intend to create a, so I don't think it's good it's not good for staff and it's not good for the public if some sometimes a meeting notice is in this paper and sometimes it's in the other paper yeah, Eric I mean, just speaking for myself, um, you know, knowing that the the Press Times is focusing on so much local stuff, I, I'd like to try to use use them as much as possible. Um, understanding there's limitations, and we probably can't um, do it for some things, which is fine. But for what we can use them for, I, th I think that's that's what I would like to see. Can I just ask a question? So, is is the direction then to use the Press Gazette and the Press Times for the postings? Is that what I'm hearing? No, it's the, the <clears throat> if we can do this, it, I think a number of, of us have commented that can we just do our meeting notices in the Press Gazette and then post just our minutes in the Press Times? And is that, you know, can we do that? How much would it cost? Those kinds of questions. Um, and I agree too. I, I mean, I feel like the, you know, the Press Times has done a really good job with covering news in our in our district and and um, getting a lot of of stories out there about things that are going on in our district. And I too would like to support them if we can, but it's 
within the limits of you know what were required. Is the press time is the press times available online as well? Mm -hmm. And is that updated? Is it just the okay? Yes. Andrew, you want to call him? Yes, uh, Ben, come on up. My name is Ben Rogers, I'm editor of the Press Times. Uh, to answer the question, we are weekly in print, but we are daily online. Uh, we do update the website a number of times a day. Um, and we do have pretty good reach on there this year. Already we have over 300,000 individual page views. Um, our print circulation has increased from around 2100 by the time the company I worked for purchased it to right around 5,000 now. The company I work for is Multimedia Channels, um, formerly Brown County Publishing. Uh, that's the Wood family, so they used to own the News Chronicle. Um, so there is a strong push for hyper-local content because there's nowhere else um, where you can really get it, where you can find out about the dress code conversation tonight, which was very interesting. Um, just some information about open records. Um, there are, uh, legal notices. They are mandated by the state as far as the typeset that you use and the cost um, per column inch or per line. Um, that increases or decreases based on the circulation of the newspaper. So based on our circulation, any notice or meetings that you would run with us would be about 40% of the cost of the daily paper. Um, so there is some room for savings there. Um, from your end and from our end, uh, we think it would be beneficial because we want to be that local news source. We want people to be able to pick up our paper to, to check the legals, um, to read the, the minutes and uh, find out what happened. Because I've been told from multiple people, they like that. They like reading that. They like having that option in print. Brenda? So you're, <clears throat> you're able, I assume you're able then to update your legal notices daily twice daily, like you said, you update the online. Uh, we update our stories online. Okay. Um, there is the paper that you're holding right mm -hmm. here. This digital version is available on the internet like that, but mm -hmm. once it's put together, we can't add or take out legals to it. Okay. Um, legals are the Wisconsin Newspaper Association has a website where every paper is listed and you can get the legals for that paper. But once that paper is printed, those are legals that are up on that for that issue. Okay. So even though you're online, we can only update our, our meeting postings once a week when you're putting out this. Right. right. The, okay. We required by um, 10 a.m. on Wednesday is our legal deadline. Okay. All right. Laura? Can you... Um, can you say if uh, you don't have to be specific about other um, other school districts, but have other school districts found a way to um, to do this? And I um, personally enjoy your paper. Thank you. Um, we are the official paper right now for the Schwabenon School District and the Howard Swamico School District. Um, we're also the official paper for the Village of Schwabenon, for the Village of Howard, for the Village of Swamico, and for the Village of Hobart. Um, they have found a way to do it. Um, I work with uh, Howard Swamco quite a bit, and if there's something that they need to get in, if they have one of those emergency meetings, they know that they can send that to the other paper. We're still the official paper of record, um, so we'd get the minutes and the agendas and all of that, but anything that, say, them or Schwabadon or, or anyone wants to do, if it needs to get in immediately, they send it to the other paper. Katie? Sandy, if I could ask you, when what days are are our meeting notices in print? Do you know? They're usually in print on Saturday or Sunday. 
I send them out Friday morning usually. The the normal ones. Right. right. You know, there's right. always the exceptions of the right. other ones. Right. No, the regular meetings. Okay. We can change. Brenda. Yeah, I guess the one thing I'd be concerned about is just the <clears throat> our community, in terms of not knowing where to look, um, and if they're used to seeing them in the Press Gazette. I mean, if they're used to, if we if we were to switch and put most of them in the Press Times, and then we post them here and there in the Press Gazette, then then uh, um, it, it messes with transparency of meetings in my head. Um, or else you're asking for people to check two places um, every time they're looking for for uh, um, meeting notices. Rhonda? Um, especially the people that follow on a regular basis, they actually go to they go to um, they go to our website. So what they're typically doing is they're looking at it through. I'm look, going to the school board website to look into where the meetings are and, and what they are and when they are. Um, there aren't a lot of people going to, I'm just going to say it, they're not going to the Press Gazette for, for that. They're going to now Agenda Manager for that. And um, so I feel like Obviously, with anything that we do, we should talk about that, what we're doing. If we if we just inevitably decide to change this, that's what we'll do. We'll talk about it. We'll educate them. Um, I'm pretty confident that they'll be able to handle that, especially the people that are, you know, typically very invested. And a lot of times, I personally get a lot of messages about the meetings, and they don't actually go anywhere. They just contact me. So... I'm not sure I could st stand on that they're they're going to the Press Gazette every week to look to see when the meetings are. So I would hope that that wouldn't derail potential changes. Thank you. Well, I, yeah, and it's there's a lot of people in our community, and I I have no idea if they're you know our our. Uh, um, um, people that aren't necessarily coming to our meetings and engaging may mm -hmm. still may still be following meetings, but I don't I don't know that for sure. I, um, and also, just to note, um, I don't think agenda manager is the right place to go <laughs> because not every single meeting that's posted is mm -hmm. ends up in agenda manager. So if you're telling people where to go, they should go to the um, uh, meeting. There's a there's school, agendas, minutes, and then there's website, board, board meeting meetings. schedule. Yeah, the website is like typically that. where I send people. Right, right. Yeah. But I just want to make sure they're not going to agenda manager because mm -hmm. that's not where where all the they're not going to see all of the meetings that we're going to have in agenda manager if then um, and they'll but they'll see them all in that board so schedule, I think meeting with, schedule with this conversation regardless of what we decide I think it's important to kind of revisit our conversation with the community about that uh, because there a lot of a lot is changing as far as the people's habits of where they're looking for this information in the first place. And with Agenda Manager being added to this, um, I think it's important that we are constantly reminding people where to go to look. Yeah, because I don't think it wasn't in Neptune. Every meeting wasn't posted in Neptune either. Yeah, so that part of it hasn't changed. Yeah, it's under just, so if the public is wondering, it's um, right under Agendas, Handouts, and Minutes on our website. It says Board Meeting Dates. And that is where all of our postings go. Uh, ben, go ahead. Um, just so I can, you know, say a couple things here. Um, if you look at what our paper is from cover to cover, it's local news. Um, every story. We're not going anywhere. We're going to keep doing this. We think these numbers are going to continue to grow subscription-wise, which is remarkable in this day and age that print subs are growing at all. Um, it's it's a paper that is 100% local news. So the people who, who read this paper are people who are invested in their communities, who care what's happening, who want to be aware of what's going on. Um, so I do think our subs are going to grow, and I think by running your legals with us, you're putting them in front of people 
who are civic minded and concerned about what's happening. Um, and then from my perspective, I mean, do you need us to formally submit a bid um, in order to do this, to get the ball rolling? Are you gonna let, look at feasibility here? I mean, what's the next step from uh, my perspective? Um, I, I would think we would, what we're gonna have, we asked, we asked for some research to be on the costs and so forth, and then I think we'd have a board discussion. If we wanted to open up a, a portion of it, we'd put out a, um, you'd, uh, RF, some, some type of RFP. I mean, it might be a little different when you know there's only one other, two entities. Yeah. Um, and it's not too detailed. <laughs> right, I mean, although there's also, if, if it's, if the rate is, if the rate is fixed by law, then it, might preclude the need for an RFP because you are just going to, so we would, we, we would contact you. I mean, I think the, the, the rate's set by law, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah, like I said, it's based on circulation for that cost per line. Now, everywhere, a lot of other places I've been to, um, what they do is they have an open process at an annual meeting where you have to get a bid into that government entity at that time. And once that bid is in, the bid is in. Um, and then usually they just go with the lowest bidder. But uh, however you guys want to do it, if you want to contact me, um, I have cards here, um, contact our office or, or whatever, we can get you that information uh, regarding the price of it. I have some sheets here today, but I can tell you um, starting in January, I believe all papers are going to be going down to a smaller font size for the legals. So that 40%, we would be 40%, we'd actually be probably even more affordable than that when that size goes down. So I could hand this to you today if you wanted, um, but I, I do think it's going to change uh, when, the, when the typeface size goes down. How small is it going to go? I believe it's going to be half a size smaller. So if it's at like a nine, it'd be at like an 8.5. Okay, so if I'm with you. Brenda? So if I'm understanding you correctly, as your, um, what's the word, as, as your readership, your subscriptions increase, your price per line goes up? Uh, it would. I'm not exactly sure how that works. If it's by like a thousand or two thousand or what that threshold is, but I mean, you know, I, I can tell you that our circulation right now is is considerably lower yeah. lower than the daily paper, yeah. so our cost would be more affordable. Because in the, in that district, or the um, what's sorry, I'm using the wrong word, but the when when you look at the number of people that you have subscribing, it's it's everybody. And same would be with the other paper; it would be everybody. So people that live in Marinette who get that count in their subscription group? Correct. It would yeah. be any any paid print circulation. Right. So we would we would for sure never get as expensive as um, the bigger paper because you're more you're more local. <clears throat> well um you're, you're uh, I hope I hope to grow that big, oh, but I mean true. it's that's <laughs> true. But you're but you're you're actually your subscribers higher percentage of your subscribers actually live in our school district. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what I was getting yeah. at. You're not target. You're not targeting Marinette where the press Gazette targets Marinette, I would suppose, or maybe not. Maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but you're, I would assume you're, if you wanted to, well, I, that's speculative. I think I, I do, I do want to make sure that I, I think it, it, op it opens up a real, I don't think it's public friendly if if our meeting notices are split among multiple newspapers, but if we can save a lot of money on the minutes, which are many more lines than the notices, that seems like that could be a win-win, a and I'd, I'd like to explore it. Rhonda? And something that I continue to hear about is the, the consistent coverage of our board business of the district business and how much your paper has taken that on compared to the daily paper. I mean, it's not even debatable, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that in fact, if we're really looking to engage our community and 
and you know that is the transparency the engagement then we have to look at that aspect of it as well so thank you for that all right and then um Okay. Actually, oh, I was going to say, or Melissa, one of the two. <laughs> okay, and then we'll um, we'll go next to the uh, the food service update. All right, hello everyone, thank you. Nice seeing everyone again. Um, so to give you a little bit of a food service update that we have, um, I would want to let everyone know that what we do within our operation, <coughs> we do for our children within our school district. And I did touch base earlier on this, but I am going to just go over the items again. Um, some additions that we are doing to our department this school year is we are looking at the food trends that are happening right now. We're doing additional grab and goes in our middle school and high schools. And when I'm talking about grab and goes, there's some of the items that you see in our local grocery stores that adults are get grabbing. Um, I know friends of mine will grab them for their lunches when they take to work. It could be some of those um, side salads or the bigger salads. It could be some of, um, as we do the parfaits right now, it's parfait items like that. And we do the bento boxes, as I did discuss. And when we make our hummus, our hummus we make within our production kitchen. That is homemade hummus. We do not buy that from a local vendor. We want to expand our menu options at our elementary schools um, with our Red Smith of the serving that we want to be doing to expand that from our third graders up. And also, we have piloted second entrees at other elementary schools, but this is something that we want to see if this would assist in adding more participation. Because right now, we run we have our meal program and we serve lunch. And everyone thinks of school lunch as hot lunch. But then what about those um, students that eat lunch every single day with us? So we want to also entertain of offering a cold sandwich, maybe offering a club sandwich or a wrap or something different. Instead of just getting a hot pack, they would get, be getting a cold sandwich. Or, so those are, we just want to try some d different innovative things for um, our students. Um, as we talked, breakfast in the classroom is something that we uh, have passion about. Um, we did have our meeting today with the principal at Beaumont, and that is something that she wants to move forward with, which is fabulous, especially with that school moving um, into our CEP schools. So we are very pleased because we will be growing our participation with that school with our percentages that we are serving right now. Um, for instance, Beaumont for breakfast last school year, we are running that at 22.54%. With the changes that we want to be doing, we will, will be increasing that participation. And with those students, um, right now with us serving one <laughs> breakfast to three lunches, that will also assist us with raising our lunch prices. So um, we're very, very excited about that. Also this summer, we have put a lot of renovations into our elementary schools. We've worked very closely with facilities on adding coolers, um, new hoods, new um, warming units and ovens, and also tables within our cafeterias. We did purchase just another food truck on the road. And the reason why we're doing that is because we're feeding a lot of kids and we need those trucks on the road. And um, this summer, actually, we even had six trucks compared to last year, we had five. So we were also serving at more parks. 
um, new signage in our schools. Uh, we feel very um, excited about the changes that we're doing in our schools and the way that they look, and our students are excited about that also. We're opening up um, NEW, and we're not having NEW look like uh, JDAL used to look like. We're not doing the hot packs. And I know at one time, when I first came to the district, that was something I was getting questioned a lot on. Why are we still doing the hot packs? Everyone, they look at that as an elementary menu. Well, we're changing that. We have um, a nice line. We brought in, um, we're doing, gonna be doing hot pizzas. We're doing hot home style lines. We're gonna be doing the salad, salads, the grab and goes for them. Also a salad bar. We're introducing some a la carte items for them also. And also we're gonna be doing new signage there. And we um, have been working with Jason Johnson, the principal with, he really wants to get the involvement of the students. So we're gonna be working with the involvement of the students also for the signage for that school. Um, with our students, we feel sustainability is very important. As last year, um, not everyone may know this, but this is something that um, came from our, as Michelle, you have your group of your parents that you meet with. And I came in and we talked about styrofoam and what a, how that is filling up our landfill. And that is not what we should be doing for our children. We need to be teaching them. So we changed all of our styrofoam trays over to the biodegradable cardboard trays. Was that an added cost to the food service program? Absolutely. That was a $40,000 added cost to our program. But with what we have been doing, we, are, we were able to cover that cost. And also, it is teaching our children within our um, district. We've added dishwashers also to some of our schools this past summer, and also moving to those schools that we put um, dishwashers in, we're putting in reusable trays. So we're gonna be moving away from those cardboard trays and having reusable trays. So um, that will be uh, a very positive. Um, expanding our offerings on our salad bars. And with our salad bars, they're not just the fruit and vegetable bars, we want to um, with the salad bars, we want to offer when we have chicken patties on there, on our menu, we want to have the lettuce that they can top with that. We want the sliced tomatoes that they can put on their chicken patties or even their hamburger hamburgers. We're looking at how can we do the cheese? The cheese is very, very difficult for the students. So is that a pre-wrapped sliced cheese or could we get creative and do a shredded cheese or a blend of white and mixed cheese so those are some of the um, things that you're going to be seeing for our students uh, something that um, this came out of uh, the reference was from USDA while some school lunches may be growing more expensive giving a growing child healthier nutrition is certainly priceless and um, when I found that that's where we want to go with, um, with the program that we have here within our um, school district. Um, as far as our breakfast, we know that breakfast is something very large that we need to expand on. But what we know is breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It provides necessary energy for the day of learning and achievement, but also improves our student behavior. And we know that, and we read that. So what do we have to do? Us, as the food service, food management company, and not food management company, but food service department within our district, what we have to do is now we, we have to get innovative, but we have opportunities. Timing is an issue, and we're fully aware of that. One in three students who participate in lunch are participating in breakfast, and I shared that earlier. We have to work on those numbers also. Instructional time, what we do not wanna do is take away from instructional time. And we talked about that today when we were at Beaumont, how we can get creative with that. And we're, we're ready for that. We are ready for the challenge. Um, and also stigma in the cafeteria, going to the cafeteria, it is a stigma, especially at our secondary schools. So that is where we're looking at purchasing kiosks. We can go to the students. Will we have kiosks for the, for the first day of school? 
I hope we do. And if we don't, we're going to have a nice table. We will make sure we have it skirted nicely. We'll have a tablecloth on it, and we will do what we need to do. Will we be at every school the first day of school at the kiosk? No, we will not. But I can guarantee we will be at for sure, too. And um, I'm excited about the two where we want to go. And as soon as I get the okay, I will make sure that we do pass this information on. Um, grab and go for innovations for breakfast. Grab and go in, in the cafeterias are something quick and fast. Our students, they want to get in, grab something, and go. Hallway breakfast. And we even have that with our special ed students now within our schools. So we can learn from them. What are they doing? During those passing times in the hall, they're selling bottles of water to the kids or they're selling the whole grain cookies. So this is something that we would like to tap on. But also, we don't want to take away from their learning skills that they're learning within their classroom. <coughs> Elementary delivered... Um, to the classrooms, that has been um, something that we really want to move forward with. But I will also share with you at our secondary levels, during the testing time, we do, some of our high schools, we do breakfast in the classrooms. And that is something at one time, they would just, um, the schools were purchasing a snack and a milk. So what we've done as our department, we reached out to them and said, how would you like to feed all your students breakfast? So then we built the breakfast for them, and it got delivered to the classroom. The teacher had the roster and would check off who had a complete breakfast. That roster came back to our cafeteria, had cooks at the secondary schools, and then they would claim that breakfast. So that is something that we have been doing for the past, I want to say, three years. We have been doing that. Um, and then something that we do know, we wish it could be as easy that there's one model for all, but there is not. So um, what we have to do is realize that one size does not fit all. And we're willing to work with each of the administrators at the schools to see what we can do to feed more children. Also, I, um, I wrote this down from our meeting that um, when we were presented about the five cent increase. We do a monthly newsletter to the school board that all of you do receive. Now, is that a good way to get our updates to you of what we're doing within? Um, because that was discussed earlier, like we would like an update of what's going on. Is that a good way to get our update to you is through that monthly newsletter? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure that we are communicating how you want to be communicated to on what we're doing. This is what we're doing at this school and just the information. So if that works for you. Michelle? I'm wondering also, Lynette and Amanda, if you have something specific and unique to the area that you don't want the board to, to miss, there's so much that comes everyone's way. Um, the Friday before our board meetings, we, we put out a communication periodically and, and, and try to get that. So if there's anything, just send it to Sandy and she can make sure it gets directly to the board in that document so then they can read it at their leisure. But they know those are things that, that are are they don't have to look for them they're right there okay, that's all perfect. we won't thank you yeah. and um yes and also also to keep um i hope i hope you make them yourself but if you get them from somewhere else that's okay too i hope you keep having the the food pun in the newsletter like the school do you make those like um, uh, the one I remember is like school lunch. It can't be beat B E E T. Do, do you make those or? I just knocked you off. I'm sorry, but you want to know who writes our newsletters? Is Amanda. Amanda does a fabulous job of getting that communication piece out, and she's looking for those fun pieces to attract people and put in the li the little food for thought. 
Thank you. Um, we also, I go to our school nutrition association, which is throughout the entire nation, um, and they have a lot of really great resources, so I can't take all the credit, but I do work hard on it, so thanks for reading. <laughs> Um, other other questions, Rhonda? Um, I, I would just like to know, uh, I know there, it was mentioned to me that there are 29 schools that are eligible for CEP, which is having basically free lunch, right? Free and reduced lunch across the board, which is what happened at Franklin Reese not that long ago, and, and it, it really helped me a lot. So when I think about, again, the father, the single father that I talked about um, having his kids make choices, on, you know, breakfast, lunch. Is there a specific reason why we have 21 schools eligible and participating, but 29 eligible, but there's there's a discrepancy of eight schools? Is that correct? If that's the case. Okay. Yes, you are correct. And um, what we've done is we separated what we're going what we wanted to review with you so what we will do now is amanda is going to discuss the cep or the community eligibility provision and she's going to break this down for you okay thank you so every april dpi collects data um, that is used with the usda regulations to determine how schools or districts can be eligible for the cep this past year, DPI incorrectly collected data to reflect that our district was eligible district-wide. Um, after intensive conversation with them, they've corrected their methodology. Um, we will also be doing a double check with them as well when it comes to this data, because it is so important. Um, but we were able, I worked with the DPI consultant that is in charge of this, the specialty provision, CEP in particular, and we were able to look at different tools that USDA provides to us as well to help us remain financially responsible. Um, with the 21 schools that we have for CEP in the 2019-20 school year, we will be able to maintain a 100% free rate of claiming reimbursement, which means all of the meals that are served to the students are served at no cost to them, and our department will receive the highest reimbursement rate. If we had gone to expand to even one more school based on the DPI data that is we are required to use, we would have lost 100% free reimbursement and we would have then gone to a percentage that is free and then the remaining percent to re go to 100 would be at the paid reimbursement. This past school year, free reimbursement was $3.39 at lunch and 39 for the free and 39 cents for paid. So you're losing out on $3 a meal at lunch when you drop below 100%. We also had some really good discussion with our district leadership on how we want to approach and what what is the standard, what is the expectation of our department of remaining financially responsible, fiscally responsible. Um, and so we feel strongly that including Beaumont into our CEP group this year, and also with Beaumont approaching us and wanting to do breakfast in the classroom, we have some really awesome opportunity to expand participation particularly. Um, and we'll also be reaching out to other schools that are in CEP that are not doing breakfast in the classroom or that have, um, we are at West High School, we're at Franklin Middle School, we're at Washington Middle School, what can we do more? Um, we're excited for that too. Um, I just want to put out there that the, I think there can be some confusion and I've kind of studied the, the formula. So there's, you could qualify a, a range of schools for CEP or a whole, or a whole district that doesn't, how many can qualify, but how many qualify at the full reimbursement rate are two are two different things. There's a lot of ways you can put the, the puzzle together, including ways in which it sounds like a lot of schools, but you would you would lose money terribly on the on the deal. So I think you know there's it is finding about I would 
I don't want to create a misconception that there's a, some school out there who, yep, you qualified and doesn't feel like it because that doesn't exist. That doesn't happen. It's a question, right, where you might add a school in such a way that it could mess up the 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 formula. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that that was that was clear because it if just when you say it, if people don't take the time to look at how the formula works, it might sound like there's a school that just doesn't wish to have universal free meals and no school doesn't want that if they can get it. Yeah, Ron? Okay, but when I look at this, it says Doty, unless this is wrong, Doty high need eligible, not participating. Doty does participate in CEP. We enrolled them in the 2018-19 school year. So what, so DPI then doesn't have accurate information? I think that might be from 1718. I think hunger free, I think hunger free, I think hunger free task force when I talked to them last said that the data that they had shared with us was still from the 1718 school year. Is that correct? That they hadn't yet updated it for 1819. So that's why Doty may not be on that list because you added them last year. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Just making yeah, sure I'm like process. It's, we've been here a long time. So. so then maybe I just need to go through East High School participating. Okay. Jackson. West High School. Yes. Yes. Baird. Yes. King. Yes. MacArthur. Belmont, yes. Elmore. Yes. And Jadel. Okay. So I and then I know you mentioned that, you know, we're again we're we're measuring need and we're varying need, but I think need is need. Right? If you're eligible, there's there's need. Yeah. I don't know if it's high need, low need, middle need. I mean this is literally listed here, but there is need. So um I I still and, and don't get me wrong, I appreciate what you do. I have an entirely different daughter now because of your food service. Seriously, she tries everything out there. She loves school lunch. Um, so I can, I can appreciate all that, but I can also question at the same time. Um, I still don't understand why those schools that are in need and are eligible aren't a CEP school. I, I understand the, the mention of being fiscally responsible, but I have to imagine there's some lunch debt there, right? And I would imagine that um, we've just raised prices. So if fiscally responsible is the mantra, I would just wonder about that. And I just would like to know, there are, have to be parents out there at these schools that I mentioned that would would really appreciate being able, and they would probably participate more in meals. I would have to think they would. I agree with you. Amanda agrees with you. We wish we could, to be 100% honest with you. There is a document that we use that will tell us how we will do with the numbers that DPI gives us and some of the numbers that you that you have received. So with that information, we did put in all of our schools with all of our information. And in one month, and we operate nine full months, almost 10, we would lose over a million dollars. A year. If you were to add those other yes. Okay. No, this would be district wide. District wide. Totally district wide. We served all of our schools. So then this is where this comes. Okay? No, it's it's fine. So we're at hundred percent right now. Okay. And then where do we pick a percent? How do we pick, okay, our percent is sixty five percent, but then we have someone at sixty four. Why are we not grabbing that 64? Why are we, and then where do we stop? And then all of a sudden, okay, we have to feed everyone, and then we're losing a million dollars. We, 
that if our food service operation would lose that million dollars and i have we we have everything we have it broken down by all the pieces if we lost that million dollars the we have to be self funded or we our balance has to be zero break even that would have to come from someplace so what you're saying is, sorry, Andrew, is it would require a million dollar investment from the mm -hmm. district to right. feed all students mm -hmm. where we currently are. The, okay. Yeah, at minimum. Which I'm not yeah. saying we should or should do. It just gives the public a sense of what that would take. Yeah. There, are, there are people in our community who have said we should be feeding all students. What would it cost? So I appreciate that. And we would love to. We would love to feed all the children. Mm -hmm. But... Um, we'll go Michelle, then Rhonda. Just a quick question. Um, you just, uh, Annette, you talked about 65%. It's the range of those nine schools, because I remember looking at them and they brought them in. They, they range 40, is it like 40%? <coughs> so 40% are CEP, or 40%, how do you... Eligible, 40% in the schools that, that we're talking about in the nine would qualify for free and or reduced, and 60% in the schools would not. Is that accurate? I would say yes. That okay. And then the schools that are all included are 50 or more. Correct. correct? And that is where we get the highest Click reimbursement. Here. I'm sorry. Sorry. That is where we get the highest reimbursement. I, I just want to make it if if I understand what what the 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 goal has and will always continue to be is to ensure that every child eats. Correct. Okay. And we do not do what some there was an article and they talked about children they were giving them less than for lunch. It doesn't matter if they don't have money, we still feed them. We correct. Feed them. That is correct. And and yep. It's accurate that we do have children who may not um, qualify in a CEP school or even for free and reduced. And yep, there is some money involved with that. And that goes to Fund 10. It is not taken out of your budget. You cannot pay for it. So there's no subsidy if somebody doesn't pay there. It comes out of the Fund 10. So it's looking at that whole balance of that whole picture to Christina's point is that if we did this, then I think what there has to be some careful planning around that in terms of budget priorities. That's all, and that was not on the radar this year, mm -hmm. and that was part of the conversation. Um, Mr. Cash is not here today, but yeah, that. Could we get? Because um, I'm, the, it it does get kind of technical with the math, and it's it's getting late. I'm wondering if you could maybe send us in the sometime in the next few days. For the five schools that are listed as qualifying but not participating, East, well, yeah, but they said three of them are, were wrong because they're actually getting it, right? So that would leave five. So East, MacArthur, Jackson, Jadal, King. So sometime in the next week or so, just let us know what the, if if we did at those schools, what that would do to the, the rates, if you get a, a chance. Yeah, Rhonda? So I just want to make sure that I'm clear about this. If you were able to get more kids in to eat breakfast, there would be better, more reimbursement, correct? Mm -hmm. So, and we have, again, the largest gap in the state as far as breakfast, lunch um, currently. So it is entirely possible that there is an opportunity to if there was a potential for kids not to have parents who had to make decisions about schools, lunch and breakfast, or if they actually could go to school and eat lunch or eat breakfast and it wasn't it they didn't have to reach in and grab because that's that's not always possible, especially for three, four kids. If that was there, it is p potential revenue creation. So if is it true or not that if we were to reach, 70% participation of breakfast, it's an additional $650,000 of potential revenue, could, which, which could potentially offset the million, right? I would have to run my own numbers. 
I would. I don't want to just say yes, and then I would, I, I would have to look at that. You, it's amazing when you can add just two students to eat two more days and how fast that, or let's say two schools at all of our schools every day, how fast that revenue can grow for us. It's amazing. So right now, we, do, we go with what we know. We don't know if we can, we're going to increase because we, we went with history. Moving forward, we have all these innovations. There's things we want to do. I'm very thankful that the five cent increase went in because we're going, I mean, tomorrow, things are going to happen. Things are going to get ordered moving forward because we need to do that. We're not just going to sit back and say, okay, this is what it is. That's not what we're going to do. Now, we need to do things where we're going to serve, the, serve these children and we'll look at what you want, you know, want, what you want us to look at for the other schools with CEP. But again, where do we, with the percentage of who qualifies for CEP, and then the percentage, where, where do we stop? And I guess that is a decision that has to come from someplace. That of, is it 100% reimbursements we want to get? Is it, 99.92 is it 98 is it we don't is it 80 percent and i'm not sure about that um but what i do know is that there appears to be opportunity and potential for revenue Absolutely. and it's there mm -hmm. but and that's what we're and doing. and we do have a need so those are things we do know as well as what you discuss that you know yes. So. Yes, I would say that is a correct statement. Thank you. Yeah. Michelle? Thank you. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that, Rhonda. I know that Lynette and I had a really good conversation. I'm looking at an email that you sent out to principals, and uh, their supervisors have been part of the conversation. You had a conversation because when you see a school where 20% of the students are eating breakfast as compared to lunch, you know something has to be adjusted with that. Because, because on the flip side, we do have schools that almost match. Uh, student by student, you can see the match. And it, and it, and it falls in a variety of schools. It, there's no pattern. So when we had that conversation, I think it was really important to make sure that the, the central office folks who help the schools help them. And I know we had a brief conversation with Mike and we're going to have to have more conversation with that because there's opportunity and I like that you're um, looking at different ways to deliver breakfast for kids and, and you know, the grab and go kinds of things. You know, kids aren't hungry right away sometimes. So, One thing I would like thanks. to share with you is when a student comes in late, Sorry. When a student comes in late for school and our breakfast has already been served, we do not deny the students a breakfast. We do have baked breakfast, their um, quick grab and go breakfast, and we work with the clerical in the, in the schools so they know if someone, and with the food service worker, they know if a student comes in late for whatever reason that they can, they have these baked breakfasts, they can offer a student a milk, they write the student's name down to give to the food service worker when she comes back at lunchtime and she will, claim, she will then claim that meal for um, that student. So I just, because I just hear things where we're not feeding, the, you know, that we're not feeding the kids or we, we shut down and we're not feeding. Um, and also, you know, the times that our schools serve lunch, if there's 45 minutes to an hour in between, if a student's so hungry he or she wants to eat, we'll feed them. But then it's also, it's on, are they going to eat lunch then? Because then what's going to happen? So we work, we are, we work that with the administration, um, with that breakfast, with the grab and go breakfast. And we know we still have more work to do. But it, as Michelle, you said, and thank you, it is a team effort. It's all of us working on how we can make this happen. How many, how many schools are actually participating in that? 
all of our elementary schools should be doing this. Mm -hmm. Yes. In the secondary schools, typically they receive their hallway pass, and then somewhere it's indicated on there that they are permitted to go to the kitchen to receive a breakfast, so that the kitchen staff knows that it's not someone wandering around or whatever the case might be. I'm done. How do you communicate that to students and families? We really rely on the building administrators to make sure that um, their families know what the expectations are within each building. And then also, oh. no, I, I did, but go ahead. Oh, okay. And, and also, those the clerical that work in that office every day, that's where the parents or the guardians coming in with the students, that's who they see every day. That is also who the food service worker will work with. But if a student comes in, they're late, and if say they're at Franklin, let's use Franklin um, as an example, and they did not have breakfast, so they want a breakfast, we, our employees start there at 6.30 in the morning. So they can go down to the cafeteria, and we have food available to make them a breakfast that qualifies for a breakfast. Christina? Yeah. I just want to add, too, that this also can be supported under the District Wellness Council. This is not just a food service department issue. This is a, a district issue. And so I'm excited that you're going to be leading that because I think these are the support mechanisms that we can pull that will further grow your work. Perfect. Laura? I just want to thank you for coming and answering all these questions and spending all this time. Um, when we have department heads that come before us, I um, kind of my overriding question that I always want to ask them is, what do you want the school board, what, what do you want to tell the school board that, that hasn't already been asked of you? Is there anything that you want to share with us that we haven't talked about, about your job and, and, and what you're doing for kids every day? Well... First of all, I can share that the team of employees that work in our schools every single day or who come in and worked on our production line that are scooping the, and their arms hurt or they're standing and they're working very, very hard. And they're doing it because they care for the kids. They're always looking oh, we should try this, what will the students like this? The passion that the food service employees have that come to work every single day it's beyond measurable. And as far as the manage managers, not including myself, um, I'll talk about myself, um, the dedication that they all have to the program and the job and the students for the district is impeccable. I am very pleased and I love my job. And I... <coughs> I said it earlier, if it wasn't for the students, we would not be here. I haven't been a food service for director for 23 years just because I want to be a food service director. I'm doing what I'm doing because I love what I do. And if you would like to elaborate on that, Amanda. <laughs> um, I agree completely. Um, for me, I need to have purpose and to feed my community that I grew up in gives me a lot of purpose and I enjoy what I do and I want to make sure we're doing the very best and that we give our best and I fully believe our department does that and we have great partnerships in our community in our <laughs> you didn't like what I said <laughs> it's like yeah so um we have passion and we're we want to share that passion with everyone. That's why we're here still tonight. So um, thank you for allowing us to say our piece about why we needed five more cents and why we need to have good partnership within our building administrators and have the board support. It's really important to us because it is for the kids. We want to give breakfast, lunch, dinner. We have our summer program. We don't do that just to do that, um, to summarize. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, I'd like to hear our workers 
our employees, our staff, everybody talk about their purpose and remind taxpayers and the people who live in this community that we have a lot of people in this district doing very, very fine work um, and that their tax dollars are going to um, very good things every day. So thank you. Uh, just a couple of couple of things quick before we wrap up here. First of all, um, I just want to make sure that, that everybody understands that it's, um, you know, you get, uh, uh, there are portions of this job that are um, regulations passed down to you through, through the state. And it's, I, I, I almost piped up when you said that the state does this or that report in April. I, I didn't want to cut you off, but I'll just say what I was going to say now. And sometimes in April, they have to do it a couple of times. And that was, that was an unfortunate situation that you were putting. Because so what happens is when we get these rules, you know, I don't think it's asking too much that when we get rules given to us by a, a third party, that they need to get it right before they send it to us. Because no one knows who the people are in Madison that just sent you a badly wrong information um, that had to be walked back and that's that's too bad because that's not that's not fair to you and you deserve to get the the you know the right information from Madison uh, the second thing is there's every once in a while there's these disturbing reports about lunch debt and then some billionaire wants to come in and and pay it and the district doesn't want to take it we'll take it yeah I'm pretty in my individual opinion as an independent elected official I would vote yes to take it if someone wanted to to pay off um, lunch debt, and and finally, just having the advantage of you know, many years of you know seeing food service departments and hearing the the presentations, you've you've probably you've talked more tonight about different things you tried and ways of listening to student input and the, the number of different things that you've tried to reach out and increase in different ways just tonight exceeds that I many times would hear in a have heard in a whole year from and from food service directors I thought did fine most of the most of the time we had good ones over the years but the the effort you know the effort to hey let's try this non-traditional I mean we had we had food service departments that would survey the kids about the food and they'd taste test. That's that's par. You know, that's that's a B if you're going out there and taste testing your food ideas. But when you're throwing in delivery systems, how can we get more kids to eat? That's you know, that's where you're that's where you're getting an, an A. So thank you. I have a bunch of foodies on the So all right. Thank you. Actually, your mention of the, I actually was approached by um, a member of a women's group at a church who is very interested in perhaps uh, helping to resolve some of the lunch debt. So I can touch base with you later and see it. And so there are no millions here. But. Right, so you don't have to be a billionaire to do it, just that was also on Right, but, right, it made the news and people were reached out. So I'll touch base with you. Thank you. You are free to go. Thank you. Thanks, ladies. Thank you. Okay. Then um, human resources. We have the um, the benefit broker recommendation. Have any discussion or comments on that? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean you, you can, but if we don't have any questions, then you don't even have to. I was just going to tell you what the recommendation will be um, for the next meeting. Uh, we did a really rigorous RFP process for our benefits broker, and we had um, a number of responses. From there, we had a first round of interviews, which we had board member participation as well as staff participation and other stakeholder participation. We then went to a final interview, which had. Uh, similar representation on that final interview and we will be bringing forward on August 19th the recommendation for M3 to be our benefits broker. Okay. Uh, questions or comments? All right. Thank you.
And then we have Associate Director of uh, Teaching and Learning Job Description. Questions or comments? Okay. And then, which, and, and I just want to apologize because of the previous meeting, I didn't, I thought this came separate from org support and not as the last thing on org support, but it's the last thing on org support, so I messed that up. So now, um, setting future agendas. Any questions or comments about future agenda topics? Rhonda? I'm going to find it. And we're discussing potential, right? Potential? Yep. Potential agenda topics, yeah. Sorry, slow, slow Wi-Fi. Where is it? Okay, I can't, for some reason it's not coming up in my, so I can ad lib this. So not that long ago, the Madison uh, Public School District unanimously created a resolution, adopted, um, supported a resolution that's being circulated through um, the state of Wisconsin for schools to basically commit to uh, saying that you know, there shouldn't be any Native American imagery, symbols, or, uh, you know, anything, mascots. pardon? Mascots. Mascots, anything that's really, um, you know, related to that. And that is something that uh, got some news, and it came to me, and uh, they're going around and, and having school districts sign on, and I think that would be an interesting discussion for us to have in the future. Uh, Brenda? Um, that's, as I understand it, it's a resolution that's mm -hmm. been put to the school board association. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, so it's something that the school boards all have a chance to vote on in, in January. Um, yeah, so, but we can, we can put it on, um, we can put it on an agenda. Okay. So, but the Madison School Board voted, they passed a resolution, they're and then just, they're, they're asking, so it doesn't, it's only taken up at the conference? Yeah, they're, Is that what you're just, saying? they're just supporting a resolution that the Wausau School District has sent right. to the School Board Association. So nothing happens to it until it gets to, in January, to the, the annual, and we probably can't talk about this because it's not on her agenda, but it, it, okay. uh, it doesn't, um, it, it's, it's a, it's a resolution that gets voted on by all, you know, representatives from all of the school districts at the delegate assembly at the school board association conference in January. And then where does it go? And then it becomes part of our resolution book. And then it becomes part of the, the message that the school board association is sending out and it becomes what the lobbyists use when they're talking to um, legislators about various things. It, it's, it's their guidebook from the school board association to how they should lobby. How who should lobby? How are lobbyists for the school board association? Okay, so we as a school district cannot take a position on this? Oh, sure we, sure, sure we could. Sure we could. I think position. there's two different, there's two different, <laughs> it would serve, I think the fact that, you know, Wausau did this and then <coughs> they're hoping that, you know, you can, you can go, you can go really big and write your own resolution in support of them and take a formal policy position or you could um, not do that but choose to support them at WASB. So I, I think it's a valid agenda topic at some point. I think we have some, I want to make sure that we're um, knowing, knowing that that issue will be going around. Uh, you know, we have some time before the, before the conference, given that we have the dress code and recess policies with high public interest. I wanted to make sure we were, you know, maybe not adding too much to the plate when we have some big discussion items, but it's a valid, I think it's a valid item for, for some point. Yeah. So what we're saying here is we wouldn't take a position unless we're directed from WASB. 
No. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that. But we're waiting to see what happens with them. No, all your. Is, what did you just say then? Oh, I'm saying because there's some. Okay, I. I'm not saying I disagree with the sentiment necessarily, but it's not. I don't think it's time sensitive right now, so I don't know that I would necessarily feel the need to commit to a specific timing for this. But since this started as a result of something that we know will be at WASB, we'd probably want to have a position on it figured out at least before that. That's all I'm saying. So I guess this is me formally asking for us to have a discussion about that before that happens. Thank you. Anything else? I just have some very quick. John, you had mentioned last spring that there was going to be a guiding document for the school year coming up that would sort of outline agenda items. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually part of tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Oh, okay. So we're going to get more on that. So I'm not even going to say anything because I wanted to see that and then be able to figure that out. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Anything else? So do, do you call for the motion to, do you, does it go back to you for the motion to adjourn? Sure. Um, all right, so we don't need to go back into closed session. I'd entertain a motion for adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. You have been watching the Green Bay Area Public School District's Board of Education meeting please visit the school district's website, www.gbaps.org, to view the program again. If you cannot fully access the information on this video, please let us know the accessibility issue you are having by calling 920-448-2025 or by email at communications at gbaps.org. We will try to provide the information to you in an alternative format and or make the necessary improvements to make the information accessible. <laughs>